I wanted to take this opportunity to welcome you all to the Kerner Commission 50th anniversary Education in a Path to One Nation. Thank you for joining us for this historic anniversary event. My name is Maria Heiler. I'm the Deputy Director and Senior Researcher at the Washington, D.C. Learning Policy Institute. And I wanted to kick us off and get us right into the event since it's going to be a full half morning. Um, and I'm going to start with introducing Linda Darling Hammond, the President and CEO of Learning Policy Institute, who really needs no introduction. So um, her bio in the pro is in the program, and it doesn't do her justice. But she is um, a person who has been fighting um, from the classroom to the White House for those students furthest from opportunity. She was the director of Obama's policy transition team. Um, she is a prolific author. Um, most recently, she has released Empowered Educators, How High-Performing Systems Shape Teaching Quality Around the World. And um, related today's, to today's topic, The Flat World in Education, How America's Commitment to Equity Will Determine Our Future. Please join me in welcoming Linda Darling Hammonds. Well, this is an important uh, agenda, and I want you to know that many organizations around the country are hosting this week uh, Kerner at 50 events. So we are joined by folks in Berkeley, in Baltimore, Maryland, in Albany, New York, uh, in Texas, and many other places, really taking a look at what's going on uh, in our country today vis-a-vis -vis the challenges that we have been working on for the last 50 years. Uh, I want to start off, of course, by thanking the people who made this possible, as that is always the case, that it's a village. It takes a village to hold a meeting. You know that. <laughs> and I want to start with Maria Heiler, whom you just met, uh, who really coordinated everything. Uh, Barbara McKenna played a very important role in this. Uh, our logistics team here in D.C., Shawnee Hood and Crystal Zugbu. Uh, our comms team, Gretchen Wright, Mandy Rodriguez, uh, Larkin Willis, Ryan Saunders, Maddie Gardner, Barbara Escobar, Julie Adams, and I probably forgot five or six other people, but I want to thank them all for making this possible. And um, my clicker is not here. There it is. Um, so I'm going to just start us off with a little bit of history. Uh, and uh, I want to start off because I've realized in planning this that I came of age in the 60s, was involved in marching and you know protesting in various ways. But for many of you younger people, the 60s feel very far off. So what was 1968 about? What was the Kerner Commission responding to? So I'm going to give you a little snippet from a Bill Moyers production just so you can see one version. Go ahead. So that's one account of what was going on at that time. I want to move to the next uh, slide, uh, because what you didn't hear in that account were any black voices. So let's hear a little bit from folks who were actually involved. These are folks from Detroit. So there was all this head scratching that led to the Kerner Commission. But if you think about what was going on in the 60s, it wasn't so mysterious. Why? Uh, there was this pent-up rage. In 1963, Birmingham March, the church bombing, uh, the March on Washington, JFK was assassinated. 64, you had riots in the cities in response to police violence, and you heard about that uh, in the little video clip. The Civil Rights Act was passed. 65, Selma and Montgomery marches took place. There was more uh, accounts of police violence, both with respect to the marchers, but also with respect to the daily life in cities. Uh, the Voting Rights Act was packed, passed, but on the other hand, Malcolm X was assassinated. 66, more civil rights action, anti-Vietnam War activism began to pick up and continued through the coming years. Uh, 67, riots sparked by police violence. Uh, 68, of course, was when the Kerner Commission report was finally issued. The Fair Housing Act was passed. Uh, the Kerner report came out. 
Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy were both assassinated. So for those of us who were kind of working our way through the 1960s, the level of intense violence, uh, both against leaders and against people in the, you know, in the streets and so on, uh, was a commonplace occurrence. Uh, and as we think about 50 years later, let me just note that in 2017, 282 black people were killed by the police. 70% were unarmed and nonviolent. 99% uh, of the officers involved were never convicted uh, of any um, assault. So what followed the 60s as people finally started to grasp uh, what was going on was uh, a tremendous set of social policy. The War on Poverty was launched by Lyndon Baines Johnson, the Great Society programs there were, employment programs, training programs, housing and urban renewal. Uh, I remember myself that in the summers, every kid could either have summer school or a summer job. It was part of what was going into the cities uh, at that time. Uh, education investments were substantial. Uh, ESEA was passed, the Education for Handicapped Children Act, desegregation assistance was going to cities, magnet schools were started, and other forms of desegregation aid. Teacher Corps brought uh, teachers to high need communities. Uh, the, the teacher shortages that had existed were actually, by the end of the 70s, uh, eliminated uh, with the federal aid that was going in. Higher education scholarships occurred, and in fact, in 1975, Black, Latino, and white students went to college at exactly the same rate. That has never been true before, and it has never been true since. But there was a moment where this uh, set of investments made an enormous difference. Uh, school finance reforms were also going on to try to equalize uh, funding. Uh, and what happened as a result was that the achievement gap between blacks and whites uh, actually was cut in half uh, by uh, the um, 80s. Uh, and uh, what happened in the 80s, of course, was that a lot of those programs were discontinued uh, during the Reagan administration, and the gap has since increased. It's now 30% larger than it was um, at that time. Uh, this is in um, reading, and you can see the same thing happened in math, a huge reduction in the achievement gap uh, as a function of those programs, and then growing again uh, in the era where those programs were ended. Uh, if we had continued the policies that were in place uh, during the 1970s, the achievement gap would have been closed by the year 2000, and we would be talking about something else by now. What happened in the 80s, of course, was that federal aid was cut substantially from 12% to 6% of school funding. Programs aimed at poor communities were cut. Desegregation assistance was ended, and in fact, there were a set of lawsuits trying to undo desegregation orders. Uh, which did uh, occur in many places, but also federal aid to states for other health, mental health, and housing uh, was cut. And that meant that states had to cut their education budgets in order to pick up the costs for other kinds of programs that had been cut. And if you are thinking about what's happening today, you can easily see the parallels between what was happening then and what is happening uh, on this very day. Uh, the war on poverty was successful in reducing poverty. Uh, there was a sharp cut downturn in childhood poverty. Uh, by 1969, uh, about 14% of kids were in poverty, about half as many uh, as um, even a decade earlier. But since then, it's increased again uh, to 22%. So we have the highest childhood poverty rate of any industrialized country in the world. And the number of kids uh, in deep poverty uh, has doubled also over that period of time. Uh, when uh, desegregation assistance was ended and when uh, court orders uh, were disbanded, uh, what you can see here, and I want to credit um, authors who, who did the work around uh, tracking all of this, that uh, segregation was high and decreased substantially when a desegregation order was in place, and then uh, in the years after, it returned and got even worse uh, than it had been before. So we've seen that in place after place. So uh, segregation is now much more pronounced than it was uh, at the, in the era after the Kerner Commission in the 70s uh, as that work was done. Uh, and segregation goes along with concentrated poverty. The proportion of black students attending majority white schools has declined. Uh, so we're moving backwards on that. Uh, and so where we are now is more segregation, more poverty, more concentrated poverty, um, gaps in achievement and attainment have grown. Uh, the proportions of kids in high minority schools 
uh, are, or in, in high poverty schools are almost exclusively minority students, we have created a set of apartheid schools that are more than 90% African American and often Latino, um, perhaps some other students of color, often Asian Pacific Islanders if you're in California, um, that are in uh, concentrated poverty where almost all of the kids are poor and that is a growing part of our education system. And while nine out of 10 uh, white and um, Asian students are graduating from high school, only about three out of four black, uh, Latino, and Native American students are graduating from high school. So we've got to contend with the issue of what this kind of inequality, uh, which we are steadily reinforcing, uh, and with the policies that we have seen and expect to see in the next year or two uh, could exacerbate uh, the costs to individuals uh, of course, uh, we'll hear more about what's happening in terms of mass incarceration and other things, the cost to the society as a whole. Uh, the fact of the matter is that the social compact in our country cannot be maintained if we don't have every child well-educated and well-employed to contribute to society. In 1950, there were 20 workers for every person on Social Security. Now there are three workers for every person on Social Security. Uh, every one of them needs to be gainfully employed and making a very good wage and paying lots of taxes to support my Social Security uh, and your health care benefits. The whole social compact falls apart if we don't invest in the welfare of every child. Uh, in the report of the Excellence and Equity Commission a few years ago, uh, this statement was made, this calculation, if Hispanic and African American student performance grew to be comparable to white performance and remained there over the next 80 years, the impact would be staggering adding some 50 trillion in present value terms to our economy, more than three times the size of our current GDP. This represents the income that we have forego by not ensuring equity for all of our students. Uh, so the issue is pronounced. Uh, we have to tackle the agenda that matters most. I wanna lead, close this little part of the program with the words of Martin Luther King, uh, who was assassinated just a month after the Kerner report came out. On some positions, he said, cowardice asks the question, is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it politic? Vanity comes along and asks the question, is it popular? But conscience asks the question, is it right? And there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe nor politic nor popular, but he must do it because conscience tells him it is right. Uh, we are at that time today, uh, and we're gonna talk about how to do that in the coming couple of hours. And I wanna begin by um, bringing Claudio Sanchez uh, to the uh, fore. He is going to moderate our first panel. Uh, Claudio, you may not know, is a former elementary and middle school teacher. Yeah. <laughs> you probably do know that he's an education correspondent for NPR. He focuses on the three Ps of education reform, politics, policy, and pedagogy. Uh, Claudia's reports air regularly on NPR's award-winning news magazines, Morning Edition, All Things Considered, and Weekend Edition. Uh, he, in 2008, won first prize in the Education Writer Association's National Awards for Education Reporting for his series on the student loan crisis. Uh, in 1985, he received one of broadcasting's top honors, the Alfred I. DuPont Columbia University Silver Baton for a series he co-produced on Sanctuary, the New Underground Railroad. I'll note that Claudio, along with two of our other panelists, Gary Orfield and Patricia Gondra, who I'm about to invite up to the panel, uh, all have to run out of here for another conference this afternoon, which is really on that issue of Sanctuary, the New Underground Railroad. So uh, these issues are being tackled in multiple ways. Uh, and I wanna invite the panelists uh, to come forward. Uh, Claudia will do introductions. Uh, we are going to start off with some remarks by Gary Orfield, who's been working on these issues of desegregation for as long as I've known him and longer than that, and is a true hero in our national discourse on these issues. Uh, John King will be responding. Uh, John is our uh, recent Secretary of Education. He raised these issues of integration to the fore for the first time in recent memory in his role there having come from New York as commissioner, uh, and before that also as a teacher uh, in, uh, 
in schools in New England. Uh, Patricia Gondra, who has been working on uh, issues of immigration and the education of uh, English learners. Uh, I'm not going to age us all this way for as long as I can remember. <laughs> but we were all friends when we were very young. <laughs> And we're delighted to be joined by Ebony Green, who is uh, a uh, executive director of Equity and Access up in Newburgh, New York. And I will turn it over to Claudio and the panel. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes. When I was invited to do this, I raised a, a very basic concern, and that was my fear that too often we preach to the choir, and that perhaps one consequence of seeing so little progress 50 years after the Colonel Commission is the result of America talking past each other. So what I would like to do is inject a little bit of healthy skepticism in some of our debate here, in my question certainly. Um, and I was reminded that most Americans, and maybe this group is the exception, but most Americans are oblivious to this nation's disappointing progress in its efforts to further the civil rights agenda towards a more equitable union. And so we have a panel here, and we're going to start with Patricia, who can uh, help us frame this, this issue, especially now with the extraordinary demographic shifts that we've seen in this country, particularly uh, among the Latino population. Patricia? I got it. Sorry, I thought we were just talking. Um, forgive me. <laughs> we're going to go to Gary first. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Scratch that. <laughs> well, I gave you a good promo, okay? So <laughs> <laughs> let's go to Gary. Gary's going to give us a sense uh, as well of this. And then John is going to um, add his commentary and his analysis. Then, Patricia and, and Ebony Green. Go ahead, Gary. Well, it's great to be here with a number of people that I've known for quite a while in this room, and, and it's a pleasure to be back with you. Um, I'm talking, I've been to Kerner Commission celebrations in the 20th year, the 30th year, the 40th year. You know, I'm getting sick of the lack of progress that we're making on so many of the issues that the Kerner Commission addressed. The Kerner Commission told Lyndon Johnson at the end of a period of tremendous social change that we weren't doing nearly enough. And a few months later, we elected Richard Nixon, who was opposed to what the Supreme Court had done, who was going to raise the issue of incarcerating people much at a much broader scale, who changed the Supreme Court in a way that we haven't recovered from since with four court appointments and set us on a course towards the racial polarization by his treaty with the Southern segregationists that made the Republican Party uh, part of a reaction. Um, this was a tragedy and has been playing out ever since. Um, we have been through massive racial change in our society. This is school statistics. That tells you what the future is. In 1970, it was a 79% white society. It was 15% black, only 5% Hispanic. It's now a poor race society, and those of us from California know how deeply it is uh, and how it's coming across the country. It's only less than 50% white students today in our schools, 15% African Americans, 25% Hispanics, and we now have as many Asians as we had Hispanics at the time of the Kerner Commission more. Uh, so we're talking about a society that's been through a huge transformation. And the groups that have grown the most dramatically are impoverished and have joined with African Americans having many similar problems of inequality and isolation. We have intense double segregation by race and class in our public schools. All of the progress we've made since the Kerner Commission has been lost. Uh, we're, not, we're back behind where we were when the Turner Commission reported in terms of isolation. And it's not just isolation by race, it's isolation by poverty and sometimes by language. 
it's directly linked to unequal opportunities, unequal quality of education, and unequal outcomes in terms of graduation, college completion, employment as adults, and many other things, even health. Students of color aren't prepared adequately for college, but college has become essential if you're going to enter the middle class. So there's still this huge gap that's actually growing, even though there's been a lot of progress in college access and high school completion. Um, the gap has not, has not shrunk for many years. In fact, in, it's still widening in terms of college completion. This is a catastrophe for the country because there's no other secure way to the middle class. The requirements for jobs have increased. And you can see the average um, employment level directly relates to the average educational level. If you were a high school dropout, you are in deep, deep trouble in our society. And if you're in high school completion, you have had a declining average income for a third of a century. If that's the highest you go. We have engaged in massive imprisonment of our young people of color. The chances are one in three that a black person will be imprisoned sometime during their life. One in six that a Latina will be, this is for, this is for males and one in 17 that a white will be. This is a social policy of huge scale that's taken large chunks of the budget of our state governments and that has been incredibly destructive. This just shows you one of the effects. This is high school dropouts, whether or not they're incarcerated. If you are a white and you're incarcerated um, and you're a high school dropout, 60% probability you have jobs, 54%. If you're a black man, it's 25%. It's a tremendous social cost to our society. Racial wealth in inequality is critical in our country now. We now have a, the average black and Latino family have less than $2,000 net worth. The average white family has a net worth of $122,000. This is partly caused by the Great Recession, which resulted in all the people who had um, predatory loans in resegregating or segregated neighborhoods losing their capital. The home ownership rate is, there's a huge gap and it's growing actually. Um, this, is, this was a catastrophe because we encouraged people to take bad loans in, in the 19, in, before the Great Recession and then they lost their homes in the Great Recession. We have a vicious cycle in our society. Low education and job discrimination produces less employment, lower wages. Low wages and discrimination means you have access to weaker neighborhoods with inferior segregated schools since desegregation efforts have stopped. Those, those conditions create a much higher probability of incarceration. And we deny education to people who are incarcerated and lack of reentry uh, re processes. Weaker schools mean lower success in college. The less college means the inability to buy homes in areas with good schools and where you can create wealth as your equity increases. Less wealth and discrimination mean that children face the same damn thing that their parents faced um, and increasingly isolated actually in our schools. All of these things are multiplied for families who are undocumented, which includes millions of families around our country. So what do we have to do? Well, we have to do everything. <laughs> Lyndon Johnson understood that you can't deal with education without dealing with poverty. You can't deal with poverty without dealing with race. You have to help on each of these dimensions. Since then, we have had no one who has had that kind of vision running our country, and we have had a shrinkage on all these dimensions. We have to think about how to provide access to good schools of our regions for the students who need them. This means if we don't do desegregation, we have to have choice plans that expand opportunity instead of increase stratification, which is what's happening with many of our choice plans and voucher plans today. We have to have expanded college access funding and support. There's a huge gap in college access uh, and completion by income. And income, of course, is related to all these other racial conditions we've talked about. We have to think about fair access to neighborhoods and housing. We haven't accomplished that yet. 
And we do still have a tremendous problem of housing supply and discrimination steering, often steering by segregation of schools going on in our country. We need race-based remedies for race-based problems. Affirmative action is a classic example. You can't solve the problem of unequal preparation for college, unequal communities, unequal families without having a positive plan to deal with it. We have to think about ways to bring back the people we put in jail back into our society. We have to reintegrate them. We can't send them off to a, a dead end um, um, acceleration school or whatever they'll call it at, as they come out of jail. We have to send them back to a decent school and we have to give them Pell Grants while they're in jail um, if they're adults. We have to think about ending all the obstacles of voting. The Voting Rights Act opened the door. It's being slammed shut in many of our states around the country now and that's one of the things that has to be addressed. And we have to think about how to reintegrate or ex accept the integration of undocumented families that have been part of the society of our, uh, of our country for decades, uh, rather than terrorizing their children and um, um, harming those communities so deeply. We basically need a commitment to racial justice and training in all of our institutions. And we need to stop thinking that we can have a magic bullet, that we can change a little bit about the structure of who organizes our schools, for example, and that it will make a big difference. It won't. These things are interrelated, they are self-perpetuating, and they can only be changed by a commitment to address them in a fundamental way in all of our institutions. Thank you. And with that, thank you, Gary. <laughs> We're going to give the floor to uh, John King, uh, former Secretary of Education. John, your take on what Gary has laid out for us? Sure. So thank you for the opportunity to join all of you. Thank you, Linda. And, and by the way, a reminder, we're going to try and squeeze yes. in some questions uh, towards the end of, uh, of this panel. Forgive me. Oh, no. Um, so no speeches, just questions. Yes. Um, so let, let me start on, uh, on first. Uh, note of additional pessimism, if that's possible, <laughs> uh, and, then, and then turn to a more optimistic note. Uh, the, the note of deeper pessimism is thinking about this from the perspective of kids, having been a teacher and principal, just thinking about what this means for students, the facts that Gary described. Consider that in DC, not far from here, you can find a school that has 11% low-income students and a school less than a mile away with 99% low-income students. So we are choosing, as a society, the double segregation that Gary described. We are choosing to concentrate low-income students and students of color in a subset of schools. And then we systematically under-resource those schools significantly. What that means for African-American, Latino, low-income students is less access to quality early learning, so students arrive at school behind already. It means less access to well-rounded education, so all of us aspire to an education for our kids that includes social studies and science and art and music and the opportunity to learn a second language, but not all kids get that. We know from the Civil Rights Data Collection Survey that African-American students, Latino students, low-income students are disproportionately likely to attend high schools where you can't even take chemistry or physics or algebra two. Those courses aren't even available in your high school. Uh, we know that low-income students and students of color are more likely to be assigned to first-year teachers. They are more likely to be assigned to less effective teachers. We know that many of our students, low-income students and students of color, are in schools that don't have access to AP classes, which we know are a critical resource for successful entry to college and admission to competitive colleges. We also know that discipline is disproportionately delivered to low-income students and students of color. We know, for example, beginning in pre-K, African-American students make up 18% of the kids in pre-K, 48% of the students who are suspended from pre-K, four-year-olds. Right, the suspension rate for African-American students is in K-12 more than three times as high as for white students. And you can go community by community and find communities where it's five times, six times higher for students of color. And it's not just boys of color. In many communities, the suspension disproportionality for girls of color is actually quite a bit higher. 
Uh, we also know that low-income students, students of color, have less access to school counselors, less access to the socio-emotional supports they need, less access to the college planning they need. In fact, in that same civil rights data collection survey, we showed that there are 1.6 million kids who go to a school where there's a sworn law enforcement officer and no school counselor. And so the consequences for kids every day in schools all across the country, including here in DC, are quite dire. Right? So that's the note of additional pessimism. But it doesn't have to be this way. And I think it's important in these conversations that we not only grapple with the reality of what we aren't doing, but also look to the places that are doing the right thing in important ways. My kids go to school in Montgomery County, uh, just over the Maryland border. Montgomery County has a 40-year history of commitment to mixed income housing and to integrated schools. It's not perfect, but both of my kids go to schools that are majority students of color, racially integrated, socioeconomically integrated, and have very strong academic performance. Montgomery County has demonstrated that students who go to schools that are diverse actually do better over the long run than students who go to schools of concentrated poverty, even when those schools get additional resources. The reality is diversity matters for academic outcomes. It matters for socio-emotional outcomes, and not just for kids of color. White students, their educational experience is diminished by the absence of diversity in their schools. We know that going to a diverse school increases your likelihood of developing empathy, improves your problem-solving skills, and again, has important academic consequences for low-income students and students of color. But Montgomery County isn't alone. There are places like Louisville, Kentucky, where their school desegregation order ended, but the community is committed to school diversity. In fact, last year, the community leadership had to resist an effort by the state legislature to break up their school integration strategy. Folks who ostensibly are believers in local control, but were willing to override local control to undermine school diversity in Louisville, Kentucky. There are places that are doing, doing good work under court order, like Hartford, Connecticut, where the chef decision is translated into a two-way integration strategy where you've got kids from Hartford going to suburban schools and suburban kids coming into Hartford to attend schools that are providing quality educational opportunities to kids. The Century Foundation had a report a year or so, or two years ago, on 100 communities around the country that are doing important school diversity work. And it ranges from dual language programs that attract families who are English learners, but also families who speak English at home but want their kids to learn a second language. Those schools are often racially and socioeconomically diverse. There are places that are intentional about their choice design, something Gary raised, places like Cambridge, Massachusetts, that has a long history of a controlled choice program based on uh, socioeconomic status that's helping to maintain diversity in their schools. There are places that have strong magnet programs, arts magnets, STEM magnets, an increasing body of research around public Montessori schools and their ability to attract a diverse student population and get good academic outcomes. There are places that are being intentional about redesigning their school attendance zones. I think about a community that had two K-5 schools, both segregated, one largely white, one largely students of color. And so they replaced those two schools with a K through two and a three through five, both of which were integrated. So we have to lift up these examples of places that are doing the right thing so that we can encourage progress. There are also charter schools that are being created that are diverse by design. That is, they are intentionally designed to create socioeconomically and racially diverse communities. Again, we got to celebrate these examples and point people to them. Final point, we also have to acknowledge that diversity at the door is necessary but not sufficient for a diverse educational experience. There are too many schools we can walk down the hall and that white kids are in the AP class and the low-income kids and kids of color are in the remedial classes. Right? That's a matter of choices. Right? We know that there are places where universal screening is not available for gifted and talented. So the gifted and talented program looks nothing like the student population of the school. That's a problem we've got to solve. We know there are kids who have the experience of curricula in which they don't see themselves at all. That's not good enough. Again, diversity at the door 
It's not good enough. We've got to make sure that kids have a diverse curricular experience, a diverse classroom experience, and we have to make sure that they have access to diverse teachers and school leaders. Uh, we know that today, majority of kids in our public schools are kids of color. Only 18% of our teachers are teachers of color. Only 2% of our teachers are African American men. This is true despite evidence that having teachers of color makes a big difference for students of color. Uh, Johns Hopkins did a study of a large data set in North Carolina showed that for African American students having just one African American teacher in elementary school increased their likelihood of graduating from high school. It matters to see role models at the front of the classroom or the front of the school, and it matters for white kids. I have a colleague who says it's a little bit harder to be racist if you're learning calculus from a black teacher. Right, a little bit harder. <laughs> right? So teacher diversity matters for all kids. We need white kids to see teachers and principals of color as leaders in their schools and communities. At the end of the day, this work couldn't be more urgent. I'm so glad that we are having this conversation. We have to acknowledge that we're having this conversation at a moment where the country seems to be going backwards on these fundamental values, not just on policy, but on tone. When you have an administration that is unclear on the difference between the KKK marching across the college campus and those who are protesting against hate, when you have kids in classrooms scared of being deported, scared of their families being deported, when you have Muslim communities around the country knowing that there was a travel ban put in place to target them specifically, right, when that is the tone that's being set, when you have the President of the United States referring to countries with unacceptable language dripping with hatred, we got to worry not just about the policy victory that we need to win, but about defending fundamentally who we are as Americans and the notion that we are a people that recognizes the human rights and dignity of all of our people. Thanks so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, John. Uh, your comments remind me of the emerging research on the impact uh, of uh, stress and the impact of um, trauma on children mm -hmm. as yet another layer mm -hmm. on children. We're going to turn now to Patricia and then to Ebony Green and begin our conversation. And I want you, um, Gary and John, to feel like if you want to jump in on something, please do so and turn this into a conversation. Reminder again, you'll have a chance to ask questions. Patricia, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. And somebody's over here keeping time, right? All right. Um, Thank you, John, for that. Those were some inspiring words, too, that there is something to be hopeful about in the midst of all of this. Um, so I want to shift a little bit um, into looking at, uh, at immigrant kids. Uh, Gary has laid out, I think, very well the radical change in the demography of this country. Um, but I think it's also important to note that at the Kerner Commission, at the time of the Kerner Commission, immigration was at an historic low. Less than 5% of the population was immigrant, and those immigrants were basically Europeans. So that's a very different picture of the world than what we have today. Today, 13.5% of the population are immigrants, about 44 million people, and this is now multiracial. As a percentage, they're actually still lower than they uh, were in 1890. So this is the second great wave of immigration that we've had in the country. And I'd like to point out that Mexicans are about 26% of all of the immigrants in the country. To hear the rhetoric around the wall on the southern border, you would think that they were 100% of our immigrants, right? But in fact, in 2016, three times more immigrants came from India, and more than three times more immigrants came from China than came from Mexico. And once again, the South is a focal point of many of our racial challenges. So let me shift to children of immigrants. One in four children in the US today is the child of immigrants, at least one immigrant parent. This is enormous. This is a significant portion of our population. But it's important also to note that 90% of these, quote, immigrant children are actually born in the US. There are kids. There are citizens. There are responsibility. There are future. More than half of the US-born children live at or near poverty, often in triply segregated situations of both race, poverty, and language. 
where they are isolated from the rest of the children in our communities. 40% of immigrant children live in families in which neither parent is a citizen. But this cannot be taken as all being undocumented. The important thing is they can't vote. Many of them are, in fact, uh, legal residents, but they can't vote. So they're not contributing to the policies that we would like to shape. And again, the fastest growth for immigrant children is in the South. So uh, Claudio and I are going to run after this to a, another uh, event in which we're releasing today uh, a large study on the impact of, the, of uh, immigration enforcement on children under the nation's schools. And um, we'll be talking about the study in which we had more than 730 schools from across 12 states and 5,400 people responding. OK, two minutes. Um, <laughs> and uh, the things that we're going to point out are that random raids and deportations of parents of the children, of, of citizen children, have the students in our country, these students, these immigrant students, overwhelmingly US citizens, terrorized. 90% of administrators in the study across the country observed behavioral or emotional problems in these immigrant students. And one in four said this was really extensive. And again, it was most evident in the South. A Tennessee counselor tells us several students have arrived at school crying, withdrawn, and refusing to eat lunch because they've witnessed deportations of a family member. Some students show anxiety symptoms. All of this impacts their ability to focus and complete work, which further affects them academically. We're undermining these kids academically with the terror that has rained down on them. And kids are losing ground in school. 70% of administrators from across the country reported an academic decline among their immigrant students. One in six counselors reported this to be extensive. And many teachers report that college-bound excellent students, their best students, are giving up on school because they doubt that they have a future in the US. And as a Tennessee administrator says, they're not thinking about college or the, or the test next week or what is being taught in the classroom today. They're thinking about their family and whether they will still be a family, whether their family will remain intact. I can't tell you how depressing this is to read thousands of comments like this from across the country. Um, it puts me into a depression. So uh, let me just <laughs> say that immigrants have always been good for this country. These immigrant students have, across time, have been our future. And they have realized great things <laughs> for this country. But we frame them as a problem as English learners, children who don't speak English, some, what they don't have rather than what they do have. And we contend that they can't assimilate because these immigrant students or these immigrant families are simply too different. Defined by what they don't have as an English learner, they look to be a problem. But in fact, these young people, these immigrant children, have at least five characteristics that make, that prime them to be our very best learners in our schools. They have resilience. These kids face poverty. They face incredible fear, uncertainty, lack of support, and yet they come back, and they come back, and they come back. These children who come from Latino and, and, um, and Asian American families also tend to have an orientation towards collaborative learning. They like to work in teams. And that's something that employers are telling us, this is, what, this is the way we need to educate our children. These children have hopefulness. They are optimistic. These are the true believers in the American dream. And these children have uh, languages other than English to build on so that they are bilingual. And we now know that there are tremendous cognitive benefits to being multilingual. And finally, they are multicultural. They can see things from various perspectives. And that helps these children to be more innovative, more creative. It helps us all to be more creative. Unfortunately, we are squandering this asset with the way we are treating these families. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Before I, I uh, 
jump in with a couple of questions for Patricia. Let's go to Ebony Green. Um, Ebony, I don't know if you have a presentation or not, but you have this pretty unique role at, uh, in your school district. I want you to tell us about that. Um, and, and actually, one question I've had once I read what you do, I thought, you know, for all the, the good intentions behind reintegrating or integrating schools, uh, too often districts have engineered uh, racially mixed schools and yet deprived minority kids within those same schools of the things that John was mentioning. AP courses, advanced placement, um, academic enrichment. And in the case of Latinos, you often find very so-called progressive policies limiting kids to language ghettos in schools under the guise of English language learning. I wonder whether you've experienced this kind of in-school segregation, and what do you do about it, at least in your case? Um, thank you. So I think that, to, so to frame my job in terms of where it came from, uh, we can start with uh, all of the things that uh, John alluded to in terms of how districts are disproportionately set up and um, their segregation within schools that are, are integrated um, was really a conversation and I, I was thinking back to my district. Um, and so historically it has been a district who, uh, that was cited for disproportionately suspending students. It was a district that uh, was sued to force integration, um, and, and so that birthed magnet schools within our district. Um, there, it was a district that when you looked at AP numbers or student outcomes of students who were um, of color, that there was disproportionately um, students not doing well. And by the way, what was the overall racial makeup? Of our district? So district? we have approximately 50% uh, Latino, um, around 26% African American, and around 20% uh, Caucasian, and then two or three percent uh, Asian. So, um, the 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 part of your question in regards to so what do you do? Uh, I think that it's an intentional decision to make uh, or have a conversation or start the conversation that says we've been talking about a need to integrate and to be equitable in terms of how we support students for decades. Um, my position itself was a birth. Um, that the Board of Education, my superintendent, uh, was very um, aware of, of the current conditions and said, let's move away from the conversation and let's move to action. So what do we have to do to be intentional about supporting um, students within our district, irrespective of who they are, um, their race, their gender, uh, whether they're LGBT. And so uh, the district that was uh, for decades seen as a place that we didn't provide access and opportunity to all students, uh, and that wasn't a secret. It took a conversation and a commitment from the board and the superintendent to say, we need to create a position that would allow us to be very intentional and reflective about the opportunities that we provide all students. Um, now, what we, what we can't do is look at it as a standalone. So equity can't be a conversation on the outskirts of a school district. What is eventually must happen is that equity has to be woven into every single department or division within that district to provide appropriate opportunity, which isn't something that typically happens. Um, and so when you, when you speak to or ask about whether um, the schools are segregated within the school, um, part of the conversation was, for example, for English language learners, um, do we have bilingual programs, trans transitional bilingual programs, or do we have dual language programs? And so that's one example um, when I say we've been very intentional about having that conversation to transition from transitional bilingual programs um, throughout the school district to say, well, let's, let's move away from that um, unless it's absolutely necessary and provide a way for our students to really not be segregated. And so we have changed many of our um, schools to be more reflective of dual language programs, which allows access for, for all students um, to that program. It creates a situation where students are then integrated and they're not isolated. Um, and, and we can really value and leverage what those learners bring to our school district to ultimately um, provide um, more access to all of our students. Because as John said, uh, students who are integrated perform better. Um, and so keeping one type of student on the fringe is not uh, beneficial, uh, nor does it ever uh, bring equitable outcomes when we look at it. One question is, how do you measure success? How do you know it's working? Um, so I, I think uh, <laughs> uh, some will say you measure sex success by uh, student achievement outcomes. Um, I would put forth that that's one piece of a bigger puzzle. Um, and so I think you also have to measure success in terms of school climate and culture. 
um, how do students feel about themselves. So it has to be qualitative data as well as quantitative data. When you only use one um, way to, to then ascertain the success of something, I feel, um, and I think maybe most of us would agree, that it gives you a, a half of an answer. When you couple that with qualitatively, how do students feel about themselves and how do students feel um, with regard to their engagement in the classroom, their worth, that to me gives a, a better indication of where we're moving as a district um, and, and ultimately as a society. Let me uh, get back to Patricia and uh, her presentation. You know, people are often surprised to learn that Thurgood Marshall, um, in preparing for uh, Brown versus Topeka, looked at a case in Southern California known as the mm -hmm. Westminster or a Menendez versus Westminster. And people don't know that during uh, the pre-54 era, there were Mexican schools, segregated Mexican schools throughout the Southwest. Um, and that in looking at that case, and if you were to read the, the testimony or read the history of that case, you'd be flabbergasted to see how and why Latinos, Mexicans in particular, were segregated in those schools. And you fast forward and look at what Patricia and Gary have done to, to describe the landscape these days, and you go, what did we really accomplish after Brown? What did we really accomplish? Patricia. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, Linda certainly showed us some data that were very uh, optimistic, right? That we, that uh, after Brown, we did make enormous progress. We do know how to make that progress, and uh, it is something that is within our ability to do. The problem is, is that um, the politics of segregation have become really, really ugly. And uh, that's why I wanted to talk a little bit about immigrants today, because immigrants are really, um, it's become acceptable to talk about immigrants as being these awful people that don't belong here, that we need to get rid of. It's a little less acceptable to talk about people of color, um, although we've certainly seen uh, <laughs> we've certainly seen those illusions. But it's become really quite acceptable to talk about immigrants and why they shouldn't be here and how we have to get rid of them. And um, we know how to integrate these young people, but we're not doing it. You helped me with a story that we did uh, NPR did out of Tijuana, uh, looking at the eight hundred thousand or so. U.S.-born uh, Mexican children who've been deported back to Mexico because their parents have been deported. And I remember a little boy, a nine-year-old at a Tijuana school who said to me, when I lived in Barstow, California, I don't think I really ever belonged there. And he showed me his hand and he said, my skin, it wasn't like their skin, but I think I'm home now. You know, this sense of identity, even in that little boy, nine years old, it seems to me is an enormous burden for children. How does that, and anybody who has any thoughts about this, how does that affect learning, this notion of identity, and whether or not they feel they're welcome and they're accepted? I think this is really important. And you know, part of the civil rights revolution was to retrain the people who are in all our schools all over the country. We had a billion dollars a year of desegregation assistance money that actually retrained teachers and staffs all over this country. There are clear results that were positive academically and socially. We know how to train people to do this. We have answers to almost all these problems that we don't apply. Um, but you know, um, we, this is something that people don't naturally know how to do. They need to have some help. They need to have some skills. And there are skills that can be um, disseminated, and when school districts or state governments decide to do that, they can make a difference. But we just think, when we surveyed teachers all over the country at one point in the Civil Rights Project, and we asked them what they do in terms of dealing with diversity, and they said, well, we just treat kids, all the kids the same. But all the kids aren't the same, <laughs> and all the kids have cultures that have values, and they need to be reflected in the schools and to be supported. We know, we learned many lessons that we've forgotten, and we need to think about how to put some resources into conveying these lessons to people who are running our institutions. People who are running the federal government right now probably aren't very interested, but there's, you know, 99% of the people who work in schools work for local and state governments. 
not for the federal government. Yeah, Claudio, <laughs> yeah, I want to follow up on that because we, really we have a huge, as I pointed out, 90% of the children of immigrants are actually born here in the U.S. They're U.S. citizens. And we have more than half a million that have been deported or have gone back to Mexico because it's simply become untenable to live here, even not being deported. These young people, many times, they see themselves as American. In, in spite of the color, they, they see themselves as being US citizens and Americans. And there's every reason to believe that many, if not most of them, are coming back. But we are treating them in such a way, what kind of Americans will they be? And how will they feel about this country? Um, because they have this sense that they belong in neither place. Going back to Mexico, where they have never been, so they're really not going back. They don't feel truly Mexican either. We well, have the, the opportunity. Thing is when, the, when the president of the United States says this is criminal, they're rapists. Yeah. Kids feel that they don't like us. And people yeah. who run our country don't like us. And, and yet they will be thing. our citizens. Yeah. Uh, John, you recently moderated uh, a debate uh, here in DC. Uh, and Howard Fuller from Milwaukee, very much a pro choice, pro. Um, pro-charter school advocate, uh, said something that, that I don't know if you remember that I thought was really um, powerful, whether you disagree with it or not. He said, um, the very idea that by desegregating schools, uh, U.S. society will become more, more integrated, more fair, more equitable, is a hoax. Do you remember that? I do. Is it? From the vantage point of black Americans, I've done stories out of Louisville and out of Indianapolis where the black church has said, I don't care if my kid sits next to a white kid. I want my kid to sit in a classroom where the teacher is good, effective, and where my kid has all the academic options that white kids get elsewhere. Whether they're mixed or racially mixed or not, it's not important to me. What do you make of that? Yeah. Well, two, two thoughts. One is, I think the reality in American society is that resources follow affluent white students. And that's just, that's just a descriptive fact. And so to the extent that we isolate low-income students of color in a subset of schools, they will never have the resources that are needed. Now, Howard's point is, we can't wait for better public policy. There are examples of schools. I worked in one. There are examples of schools that serve a concentration of low-income students and students of color that do exceptionally well. And so we can't wait. So we should focus on building those kinds of schools. And I, I, ultimately, for me, I think we need a both-and strategy. It is true. We, we can't wait. And for principals and teachers, they can't show up at school and say, I wish I could teach my kids. But until we integrate all of our schools, there's nothing to be done here. That would be a tragic mistake. At the same time, we need to stay committed to changing our public policy to produce integrated schools for a reason that Howard didn't speak to as much in that debate, which is that if we want an integrated workforce and an integrated society and an in integrated civic culture, a lot of that does start with schools and what students experience in school. You know, Beverly Tatum in her new book points out that for white folks in America, 70% of white folks in America have a social network that is entirely white, right? And that has consequences then for how we conduct civic discourse. It is part of how we end up with lead elected leaders who engage in hate speech on a day-to-day -day basis. If we want to change that, we have to change folks' experience of the society. Yeah. Reminder, in uh, just a couple of minutes, we're going to go to questions. Is there going to be a person going, running around with a microphone? OK, good. I'll call on you in a minute. Uh, Ebony, the, um, do, is there busing in your community? There is. Where you bus in kids who otherwise would not be going to those schools, those yes. neighborhood schools? Yes. And do these kids tend to be black or Latino? Uh, well, they do, uh, partly because the, the majority of our district is black or Latino. But um, so, there, so the mixing, then, is limited to the extent that the population is mostly black and Latino. Yes. The reason I, ra I raise this is because you know I've heard many African American parents say, "Look, the problem is that the burden, initially at least, with the busing issue, the burden was put on black parents and families. 
And it was, you know, a one hour, two hour ride back and forth to schools where they weren't welcome to begin with. So I don't know if that was one reason why the busing issue became, um, aside from just blatant, you know, racist views of uh, importing black kids, but I don't know whether that ever was a practical solution. Does anybody have any thoughts about why busing just didn't work? It did work. <laughs> where it was done most dramatically, it worked best, where cities and suburbs were both included. Um, we worked with Louisville uh, in designing their plan after the Supreme Court change. We surveyed the students and the parents. They'd been desegregated for 45 years. Both said they wanted to keep it, that it had been valuable for their kids. The mayor of the city came into court and testified that it was a city where people could come in, employers could come in and know all the students were prepared and they knew how to work together. Um, now, you know, it's not true that it failed. It was, it, George Wallace is one, the guy who turned integration into busing. Richard Nixon's the one who popularized it. But most children in the United States go to school on buses. They have for decades. There's no evidence that transportation is any threat to people. It, it actually, the, if you survey kids who are on buses, they like the experience of being together in the morning. This is, um, as, as Jesse Jackson said, it's not the bus, it's us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I stand corrected then. Um, go ahead, Evan. I, I think it's effective in the sense of what is our goal, right? And so I think if you start from what, was, what is the intention? The intention is to provide our students with access to appropriate education. Um, so myself, as a child growing up, I sat on a bus for over an hour, and I didn't grow up in Newburgh. Um, what I will say is that I think parents, at least in my community, value the access to those opportunities that they feel most um, support their child. And so the bus in to them is a minor inconvenience. Um, but in a district, our district is very uh, sp spread out, so the, the likelihood is most students get on a bus anyway. Um, but I think when parents are thinking about what do I need uh, to provide my child, they're not worried about the, the longer bus ride. They're, lo they're worrying about when my child goes to school, do they feel engaged? Do they feel as if they're welcomed by a teacher who understands who they are in the room and wants to educate them um, and help them reach their fullest potential? Um, when my child comes home, when we have conversations, are they able to speak to what they learned or what they attained within that classroom? So um, I think for parents who are in a position where they feel that most of the time we fail them as a district, or we fail them as a nation, or we fail them in, 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 in providing them with appropriate access um, and, a, and an education that really um, is rigorous, um, I think they're okay with that minor inconvenience because they know in the long run their child is going to have an opportunity um, to go well beyond what we would say academy field where we're from um, to go to college and beyond. But the, the practical problem that, that I think your question raises that we have to grapple with is because of a terrible Supreme Court decision, the Milliken decision, Good. which said we could only solve the problem of segregation working within the urban district and couldn't include the suburbs. That was out outside, of Detroit. Out of sight of Detroit. Yeah. Because of that decision and decades of white flight, we can now today really only tackle uh, the problem of school segregation by thinking cross-district boundaries. Now, there are places, D.C., New York City, where there are significant white neighborhoods, gentrification that you could take advantage of to create more integrated schools. But there are many places around the country that are so racially isolated. Think about the city of Rochester in upstate New York. There's no solution to the segregation of Rochester schools that doesn't involve somehow bringing in the suburbs but people will travel for good things for their kids, right? And so if you say, here's an art school that you can access as a suburban parent that wouldn't otherwise be available, folks will travel for that. We see that in Hartford. Folks are willing to have their kids come in from the suburbs because there are good things in those schools that they want for their kids. And by the way, uh, the second panel is going to dig deeper into school issues, so uh, we should look forward to that. Let's take some questions, squeeze in some questions in the, in the last few minutes here. Um, there's some questions in the back. Um, I don't know who raised their hand first, but you all wrestle for it. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm. Uh, Could you Patrick. tell us, by the way, who you are, and and again, limit your okay. question. Is it on? Is it on? Okay. I'm Dr. Catherine Collins, a little New York louder. State Board of Regents. Could you speak a little louder? Dr. Catherine Collins, New York State Board of Regents. 
And I would like to ask Gary, if he would, tell us a little bit about the Buffalo Project that you've worked on mm -hmm. and some of the recommendations that you have given to us. I'm from Buffalo, by the way. <laughs> Buffalo, New York, for those of you who don't know, is um, once a great industrial city has had hard days and is, um, has been in decline for quite a while. It has a overwhelmingly non-white school system. It has the remnants of a magnet school system, which was very successful in the desegregation days, but now has resegregated. And its very best school, um, City Honors School, which is a famous school, now has very few African Americans and almost no um, immigrants. Uh, what we found when we investigated there, and we'll have a book coming out in a couple of weeks on this um, called uh, Discrimination in Elite Public Schools, is that once you drop the desegregation plan that reached out and included students, minority students in that excellent school, it resegregated by race and by class. And in order to change that, we proposed that they change the way they use testing, the way that they reach out for students, how they recruit people, they put out literature in the name, in the languages of the children are moving into the, into the district, and do a variety of other things. The Office for Civil Rights really pressed them for some time, um, and some of these problems have been resolved. Others are still unresolved. We propose that instead of just rationing this access to one really excellent high school, they create a duplicate of it. Um, because um, it's not rocket science to create a magnet school. You just have to get good teachers, good administrators um, together and create a demanding curriculum and invite students in and recruit them across racial and ethnic lines. It creates amazing things in old buildings. Why not double it? We haven't been able to sell that yet. But, you know, we have to think about all of these details in each of our cities because the, the guidance that we got used to get from the courts doesn't exist anymore. We have to get it from ourselves. Another question um, up front here. Um, hi, I'm Rebecca Kay. I'm the acting superintendent of Oklahoma City Public Schools. Um, and my question, I have a policy problem. Uh, we are 54% Hispanic. About a third of our kids are English learners. We have gone community eligibility because it's the right thing to do for our kids to give them all free breakfast, lunch, and snack every day. My district's about 90% free nutrition price lunch. Going to CEP is gonna dramatically underreport the number of kids that I have that look like they're low income. And the terror that you guys talked about um, is making that even worse because it's getting harder for our families who are undocumented to even raise their hand and say, my kid uh, is eligible for benefits. Um, and we're in this position where even when we did reapportionment for our school board districts, uh, two out of my seven board districts represent about 60% of my students because they're, the census undercounts the kids that are in our undocumented uh, communities. So um, I'm really interested in like, I'm, I'm sure that uh, Secretary King, you've thought about this problem a lot. I don't know what you guys are doing, Ebony, in New York. Uh, what advice you have about kind of solving this or making it better um, for our kids? I mean, I think part of the challenge is I'm not sure that, that can be solved by the district, right? And that's really a question of changing both federal and state policy. Um, we've got to change our politics in order to do that, right? I, and, I, and I think this goes to, to Gary's slide about what a civil rights justice agenda should look like, right? If we need a movement across the country to make sure we elect folks to federal and state office that are committed to that agenda, that's what's going to change what's going on in Oklahoma City, not just on this issue, but I know you are also struggling with the challenge of Oklahoma's unwillingness to invest in schools generally and the challenge of trying to recruit teachers when teacher salaries in Oklahoma are abysmal and the legislature has been unmoved by the evidence. So we've got to change, ultimately, who's in the, those decision-making seats. But um, I, I have to ask, uh, maybe Patricia can respond. I mean, in Oklahoma City, 
even if you're undocumented, a child still has legal access to public schools. That was the decision in Plyer. Um, so isn't it a, an issue of having parents understand that they have the legal right to enroll their kids in public schools? So that, that sense of fear Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've seen, yeah we've, we've seen exactly the same thing in our data is that uh, huge percentages of people were saying that the parents would no longer sign permission slips. They would no longer sign slips for uh, free lunch because they have become wary even of the school district, that the, the, the district might be complicit. 88% of the people who responded to, you know, of these thousands of people who responded said, we need to have forums in our community, school community forums, where we can talk to these parents. Of course, many of the parents are afraid to come to the school even. Mm -hmm. But we need to break this down because it, you know, this is starting in the home where the, where the families are terrorized and they are afraid to show up and sign anything. Ebony, is that a problem in your community? Absolutely. Um, we, we have a large uh, immigrant population and, and so, when uh, Patricia s spoke to the terror, um, I, re I reflect on many students that I know, our attendance took a hit um, because students were just fearful to come to school, partly because some would come to school and then by the time they got home, their parent was taken. Um, the notion that my parent could be taken. Uh, and, and so, I mean, we can't lead by fear. And so to know that this is impacting students who otherwise have challenging lives in their community and so now we're re-traumatizing them with an additional layer um, it's just something we, we can't operate from that position. So um, I agree with her. I think in the school districts across the country, um, you don't know what to say well enough so that students believe you. Because they, they, they trust me, um, but they're already in a place where they don't trust the system. Um, and so now we've added a layer because our leader is saying that um, we're going to ensure um, that this will happen. And so uh, it, was, it was actually, and, and we, still, we, we still battle with it, but it's definitely a challenging situation for um, our students just to create a place where they feel safe and, and so we, we really um, made a lot of efforts uh, to make sure students felt welcome to come and at least know that with, when you're with us you're safe like we can't guarantee out there but we can say when you come here um, that we will do everything we can to protect you we have uh, about five more minutes for questions there's a gentleman up here who's raising his hand uh, Mike thank you Raymond Pierce with the Southern Education Foundation um, just picking up on a comment you said, um, Don, about um, a both and strategy within the context of what Gary was talking about in terms of um, choice plans. I'm sorry, can, can everybody hear him back there? Yeah, a little louder maybe. Okay, um, uh, the, the pace of choice plans, so-called choice plans, vouchers, charter schools, whatever you want to name it, in the South and the General Assemblies throughout the Southern states is accelerating at a really rapid pace. Um, so I'd be interested, Gary, because you said something about, um, that I took to mean that um, uh, you can actually have some good choice plans. Mm -hmm. So could you briefly, either one of you, describe a, because you talked about this, is this political? I tell people all the time, since when has education not been political? Uh, <laughs> so what would be a political platform, a political strategy, a political response to, this, to the legislators and the General Assemblies throughout the Southern, and throughout the United States in terms of these choice plans? or right-sizing these choice plans? Well, we know from studying choice plans ever since the freedom of choice days in the South and, um, that if you have choice without civil rights policies attached to it, it will increase stratification. It will increase inequality by race and by class because the people who are most connected will figure out the way to get into the best schools and the people who have the least information won't even make a choice and they'll be sent to something that is the residual. So the civil rights requirements you need for a choice plan, we've known them since the 1970s. You need to have a plan for diversity. You need to have fair recruitment and information for all parents. You want to have all parents make a choice if possible. Uh, you want to make sure that, that the children can get to the choices by transportation, because otherwise you're just giving choice to people who have the ability to transport themselves. Um, you, have a, you want to have a choice that's worth making. You don't want to have send kids across town to a school that isn't any better than the one in their neighborhood. So you want to do a few things that we learned a while ago, but we've forgotten. And most of the choice plans that we've adopted 
in the last 25 years. None of those things exist. And if you have now, a lot of the choice plans are being made even worse. I understand virtually all of the magnet schools in Alabama, for example, are becoming selective. Once you become selective on the basis of things that are directly linked to family education and income um, and the ability to transport yourself, you are resegregating on a grand scale. So you have to think about this. And you have to be sure that like your minority caucuses, your progressives in the state legislature and so forth, understand that how you do choice makes a world of difference. It can either increase equity and opportunity or it can increase stratification. And if you don't think about it, it'll do the latter. Yeah. I, I agree with everything, Gary. So the one thing I would add is that what you see in some states is vouchers being, being advocated for uh, in ways that are disingenuous. So I think about the state of Indiana, where the case for vouchers was made as a social justice case, using students and families of color as a cover for a voucher program that now disproportionately distributes resources to affluent white families and basically is paying for kids who are already in private school to go to private school. It was a scheme to shift resources away from public education to private schools. And we know the history of voucher programs, particularly in the South, and the way they have historically been used as a way to maintain segregation to allow white families to opt out of, the, out of the system. And I worry that part of the political trend we're seeing around vouchers is really designed to, to recreate uh, those old segregation academies. If I may, with regard to charter schools, I think it's important that we understand how to leverage the resources in the room, right? So um, when we as districts have to figure out ways to work together and, and we don't have the skills or we don't know how to do that, um, so for me, my experience with um, uh, Southern Education Foundation or, or uh, Racial Equity Leadership Network has allowed us to come together as leaders to create thought partners. So if, if, if I don't know how to do something and you're doing it well, we can't be shy in saying, can you help me with that? Can you assist me? Can you support me? Um, when, when I'm hearing even yesterday, a lot of the conversation, every single piece of our economy leads us back to education. If our students uh, don't have access to health care, if our students don't have access to um, uh, appropriate housing, those issues and problems funnel their way into our schools. And so it's essential that there are critical um, friends around us and thought partners that we can ask and leverage. So how did those charter schools in Hartford, for example, they came and helped us out in Newburgh when we were trying to figure out how those magnet schools should run and how we create systems that are most successful. So I think one thing that can't be missed is that um, the information and knowledge is in the room with us. And so what we really have to do is to work um, smarter, not harder, and leverage those resources to, to bring people together, to become thought partners, to share what's working well, to problem solve barriers, um, problem solve barriers. And, and essentially, that puts us in a place to be able to leverage that information and then bring it to our government to say, here's what we need, um, and here are all the people that believe um, this is the better way to move forward. We are out of time. Thank you, panelists. And we'll see you all in 15 years. <laughs>
Uh, she is a lawyer by training. Uh, she's worked as a legal aid lawyer, uh, serving low-income families, a juvenile and domestic relations a district court judge. Uh, she helped integrate the Virginia schools in Richmond, Virginia, when her father was the governor in Virginia, and we'll hear more about that. And she has been crusading both for uh, equity in education and for how to bring high quality educators to students in high need schools for a very long time. Uh, Nira Tandon is next to her. Nira is the president and CEO of the Center for American Progress and the Action Fund. Uh, she focuses on how both organizations can fulfill their missions for all Americans. <laughs> she served both in the Obama uh, and Clinton administrations as well as on presidential campaigns. Uh, she used to be about six foot two, but uh, <laughs> she, <laughs> she has lived to tell about it and has made enormous contributions uh, both in her roles uh, in government and her role at the Center for American Progress. Uh, she uh, was also Senior Advisor for Health Reform at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, where she really worked on uh, helping to bring into um, being the Affordable Care Act. Uh, I remember hearing on the news recently from one person who was being interviewed out in some uh, state that was uh, articulating their views on health care, and they said, well, I don't need Obamacare. I have the Affordable Health Care yeah. Act. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so that, that accomplishment, which you know lives on, is uh, an important one. And then uh, Roberto Rodriguez. Roberto is now the president of Teach Plus, an organization that really supports teacher leaders to play a role in education policy and practice. Uh, but many of you know him for his many years of service uh, in the Obama White House. He was the deputy assistant to the president for education. Uh, and before that, he spent uh, how many years? Eight years as the principal education advisor to the late great U.S. Senator uh, Ted Kennedy. Uh, he began his professional career here in Washington with the National Council of La Raza, where he directed uh, education uh, research and policy analysis. So we have a star-studded group of very thoughtful people to help us really think about uh, what the uh, situation needs to be for us to make progress. And I'd like to put one question in your minds as we start this panel that came up in the last one, which was that um, we, we heard from Gary Orfield about the fact that uh, quite often uh, we have to ration the good stuff. People have a school, they say, well, then you've got to compete to get into the school. Uh, why do we ration the good stuff rather than replicating it so that we have good schools for all? And when we think about choice, uh, when we're thinking about schools that people choose, how do you get a system of schools worth choosing? Rather than some schools that people want to choose and other schools that people have to go to because they couldn't get into the ones that they wanted. So I think this is part of our theme. And Zaki, I'm gonna really start the conversation uh, with you. Um, you've been uh, with the Alliance for Quality Education. You mobilize communities across the state of New York and work with others who are working across the country to advance racial equity in schools. Uh, can you speak to some of the progress you've seen in your work and what your advice is about how students and parents can make a difference? Sure. Um, first of all, I want to lean into folks. Um, I, yesterday and today, you know, it, oh gosh, it's so depressing. I don't know how <laughs> we're going to get through this. And I'm, I'm, res I'm reminded and I share with folks, I, it's, it's what Catherine said. I, had, I don't have, we don't have the obligation. We don't have the right to, to sit back and say we're going to be depressed about this. It's like get over your stuff and figure out how we're going to make change. Mm, because I want you. you to understand the time that you spend <laughs> wallowing and figuring out how depressing this is, there are children and communities on the other side of that that you need to figure out generationally. We are seeing people intentionally try to sabotage kill and murder anything that looks brown, right? And so if we're willing to open our eyes to that and say, you know what, that's not something I need to turn the mirror around, that's not something I can get down with in this moment, then get over whatever is keeping you depressed and figure out how we're going to move and shake. Because our children at the end of the day are at the end and they're suffering. And it's not OK. It is my, it is my lifelong passion and mission to make sure that all those things that I've seen and witnessed over these last two days, but even prior to this, are things that I've committed my life to, not only for my children, but for children out there. And so as we sit and we, and we, and these things and we take them in, one, take them in and, and feel it. Because those, there's people on the other end that have been experiencing it. 
and it's their lived experience. And so I think part of that is really something that we need to just like hold because I think if we're able to do that, we won't get a number 45 again, right? It's because we, we get over it too quickly and we try to not look at that. But there are people that go away from work. When I go to work and I go home, it's no different. The difference is that I have to be happy with my children and I have to portray another side of all that I'm fighting for on the other end to save the lives of children in New York and even nationally. And so we don't have the right, as Catherine said, we must be optimistic, we must be hopeful, we must bring that into every room that we walk into because the people are most impacted need to feel that instead of generating it amongst themselves, right? They need to feel that from others who necessarily don't look like them, that we're gonna do something collectively to make a change towards educational justice as well as educational freedom and liberation. And so part of the work that we do as AQE, as I, I, I started as a parent volunteer with AQE probably four years before I became employed by AQE. And so I believe in the passion and the vision of this equity lawsuit. And so part of that and, the, and what I've seen over the years of bringing parents up, like they, it's always a sense of hope. Right? Even behind the tears of sharing with legislators and others about the impact of not funding schools, they always are hopeful. They're hopeful because they don't have the right to be anything else other than that. Students come in and they share the stories that are happening. They're clear on the stories, the things that shift that they want to see in policy, rather it's around school suspension, rather it's the 12-year battle that we've been fighting in New York State around a campaign for equity lawsuit that was brought that was decided upon 12 years ago and we're still fighting for the 4.2 billion, not million, billion dollars, but yet we're, we're faced with a governor who says money doesn't matter, right? But we, can, we bring parents every year up to Albany and locally to share the stories about, yeah, it does matter. When I can't provide art and music in schools, if my children doesn't, don't have access to after school programs, AP courses, right? Like that's, that matters and it takes money to do that. So it's not money for the sake of having money. But I think the positive and the things that we've been able to do, one, for 12 years, keep that alive in the, the masses of brains of folks. Because it's not easy to make CFE sexy. It really is not. And yeah. we know in this vein of making things sexy and hot and something that people want to report on and want to understand, like you got to do backflips to figure out what that is. And so what we've been able to do is create, have a, a, a website where parents can actually go and see how much money their school is owed. So that's the agitation piece. What? My school is old, my son's school is old almost a million dollars, literally. Um, what, my school is old this much? How is that possible? What can I do? And that's the moment that we kind of move in and we ask them, well, what are you paying for now? Copy paper, all those things, you know, that everybody's paying, paying for now. And so that's the agitation to then say, call this person. This is the person you can call, your assembly member and your senator. And to be able to keep that alive in the, in the media, in the press, in the, on the ground, for students and parents to constantly still be talking about that has not been easy, but I think it has been really powerful because it has not let our elected officials off the hook in ensuring that they fund our schools. Um, because without our stories, it becomes just a numbers game. Oh, 20% of this, that. But what we know is that almost 75% of those dollars would go to black and brown children across New York State. Um, and so the question always for me is why aren't we doing this? And that's kind of the thread I've heard over the last two days is like, we have the answers, we know what needs to happen, and all I can see is that they have black and brown and sh black and brown children or poor children that are not receiving this, it's the same crust of the, learner, the Kerner report as well. Um, so until we're ready to center racism, I think was, we, we will find ourselves here again, um, I'm sad to say, um, but I'm hopeful that the folks in the room will like, nah, that's not gonna happen, because we got your back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just wanna say, uh, c coming from California for a moment, uh, the work that uh, AQE has done, while it hasn't uh, achieved the goal of acquiring all of that $4.2 billion, mm -hmm. it has moved the needle each year on funding in ways that wouldn't have Absolutely. happened without that effort. Uh, and in California, uh, we had the slide from what some people call from first to worst, where we were you know, one mm -hmm. of the best states on funding and um, managing schools in the 70s and became one of the lowest funded states uh, in the country uh, just a few years ago, and people advocated for many years, did research, caucus, et cetera, funded uh, advocacy, and uh, ultimately we got one of the most progressive school <coughs> finance reform uh, agendas in the country. Um, and we've been now seven years into uh, leveling up the funding for schools that serve kids in poverty, English learners, uh, children in foster care, <coughs> 
Um, and it's beginning to make a big difference. We just did a study that found that, in fact, in those schools, graduation rates are influenced as our test scores by the availability of those resources. So one of the things about this battle, and everyone who's been in the civil rights movement at any point in time knows that it doesn't happen overnight. And you have to get up day after day, say, what am I going to do today uh, to keep my eye on the prize, to keep making progress? And it may happen in California one year, it may happen in New York the next year, it may happen in Virginia uh, the year after that. And uh, you have to have that kind of, as you say, hope and perspective. Um, and let me ask you, you've engaged in desegregation as a student, as a parent, as a policymaker, and now as a scholar. You bring us insights from uh, Virginia as a state and from Richmond as a city. Um, how does your experience, uh, both in the city and the state, reflect the challenges and opportunities we've talked about today, and where do you see the opportunities for progress? Well, thank you, Linda, uh, and thank you for the chance to be here and for Lorraine Policy Institute's great work in bringing this terrific forum uh, together. Uh, yes, so I hail from Richmond, Virginia, um, uh, once the capital of the Confederacy. Um, to still felt that way a little bit when I was growing up there uh, in the 70s. It doesn't feel that way now. It's actually a, a very progressive, um, uh, exciting, millennial place to live, uh, population going up uh, in, in the inner city. Uh, but uh, uh, and I want, but I want to reflect a little bit on my experience as a child, a little bit on my experience as a parent and policymaker. Um, I, I, Roberto and I, sitting here listening to the last panel, feeling the same things that Kia is talking about. We, I promise to uh, uh, channel my inner Pollyanna. So I want to, uh, I want to uh, enter in with a little optimism as well. Uh, but, but starting. So my family likes to say we helped integrate the Richmond City Schools in 1970. It is true. My dad was governor in 1970, a, a, a Republican governor, the first uh, uh, Republican governor since Reconstruction, and uh, announced in his inaugural address that he wanted to advance racial reconciliation in Virginia. Uh, and uh, a very few short months later had an opportunity to help live that reality when our schools were ordered uh, bust, and I and my siblings went to formerly all African American schools, and they pretty much stayed all African American schools. So the, the we say we helped integrate the Richmond City Schools, but I, I've 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 uh, come to the point where I can no longer really say it that way because that school that I went to, what was then Mosby Middle School, named after a Confederate hero, now Martin Luther uh, King Middle School, uh, but that school that I went to in 1970 was. 100% African American before I went in, and then was maybe 96, 97% mm -hmm. African American uh, uh, by the time I left there. It's 100% African American and 100% low income uh, now, um, and very, very resource challenged. And in ways, in ironic ways, you know, great faculty that that school had then. Well, the good news is African American leaders, women can get jobs in other professions now. But that has pulled some of the great teachers out of uh, schools, certainly African-American schools, certainly uh, in the South. Um, so uh, on the one hand, uh, we, 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 the experience of segregation and desegregation is so different from one place to another. But I don't think that our church in Richmond would look like um, the church you showed here, frankly, because I don't think we ever really succeeded in integrating our, our city schools on any lar large basis. We do have uh, a handful of schools within the city that are diverse, and uh, my children all went to those schools and had great educations there. But the vast majority of the city schools are, are segregated by income and by uh, race, um, and, and frankly, very, very challenged. Uh, now, uh, an ironic twist is that our surrounding uh, suburban jurisdictions have gone from entirely white uh, jurisdictions, the ones to which most of the, 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 the city white population fled uh, when the busing orders came down, to now being actually some, having some significant racial diversity uh, and some significant, uh, uh, significantly diverse schools uh, within those jurisdictions. They've got more potential, as John pointed out, um, to uh, um, uh, integrate further. But, it, but they actually do have working examples of healthy, uh, integrated, diverse, culturally and economically and racially diverse schools uh, that are delivering great education. Um, uh, the, um, um, the, 
Well, so, so many things to reflect on, but the one thing I, I think I'll jump to and then yield back uh, is one of the biggest changes now in the Richmond City Schools and in our surrounding jurisdictions is this influx of, influx of new Americans. So the Richmond City population uh, division-wide when I was a kid was white and black. There were no brown. There was no anything else. And it wasn't just that we didn't see it. It simply wasn't there. The new American population throughout Virginia has gone way, way up, including in Richmond City now and in our surrounding jurisdictions. And that's going to be my Pollyanna point. What a point of strength that is. And frankly, I think it's a big part of why Virginia politically has moved mm. uh, from a traditional southern state to a, 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 a we won't call it blue because it uh, depends <laughs> on the election year, but a, a purple, more, much more mid-Atlantic state. And a lot of that has to do with um, having uh, significant new, pop, new American populations and, frankly, African-American populations that are now very, very politically engaged in ways that they weren't allowed to be uh, back in 1970. So, um, and, in, and in those school communities, we've got diverse, diverse some diverse reality and a lot more diverse potential. And the last point in, in my Pollyanna uh, uh, mode is the, our schools are doing great work by many of those communities. So even though we see those achievement gaps on your charts, Linda, which are you know depressing as all get out, all those charts are going up. The, 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 the academic achievement lines are going up for all populations. And what a remarkable feat that our public education system has absorbed this huge influx of new Americans and helping them become um, full Americans, helping them learn English, helping them learn all their subjects, and going on to be such um, successful parts of our wider population. So that's my, there's my, my <laughs> Well, my since moment. you're be, being determinedly optimistic, I'll That's my, that's I'll my share, moment for the day. I'll share a um, story that I heard recently, which is that, you know, it's, uh, this, I share this with you, that when you're short, you have to be optimistic because the glass always looks half full from this angle. <laughs> You know, maybe if you're a little taller, it might look half empty, but you know, we'll, we'll go with the half full. Uh, and I want to come back to you around this question of if it is really the active population that may change policy and politics, what are the strategies we need to use around voting and around uh, getting that vote mobilized? Um, and I'll come back around to that. Nira, um, you have been um, leading uh, considerable work on equity at the Center for American Progress. And some of that has been around the school finance issues that you know, continue to plague us. Some of that's been around the role of quality teachers mm -hmm. um, and the role that resource equity uh, plays in supporting their work and adequacy. Um, how are you thinking about the kinds of investments in schools that can move us towards racial equity? Yeah, so I'll just say a few words about that. Um, and uh, it's a great honor to be on this panel with so many, so many leaders, um, and also uh, uh, in part of this critical, critical discussion that's been taking place. I, I have spent a lot of my time on healthcare, but uh, I did spend a year uh, working for the New York City Chancellor of Schools, where uh, we s confronted all of these challenges on a minute by minute, if not second by second basis. So. Um, I'd say uh, a, a few things just at the largest level. Uh, truly the big challenge in public education around efficacy is money. You know, I like to say that, um, <laughs> I like to say that, you know, when we're having these battles with conservatives around uh, education issues, I always find it interesting that the uh, conservatives believe in the free market everywhere except when it comes to public schools. So everywhere else, it's like you pay for what you get, mm -hmm. and the more you spend, the higher quality it is. And so when you're t talking about you know what you invest, it's like what you get back. But uh, in public schools, it's that everything is over-resourced already, mm -hmm. and uh, teachers don't need to be paid more. They're doing it for civic good, mm -hmm. and uh, and oh, there's already too much money in this in this place. Um, so, I think truly, if you look at the investments over the last 50, 60 years, we're just under investing in public schools. That is the bottom line. There's a deep chasm between uh, both urban and rural schools and wealthier suburban schools, and there's a deep chasm between 
higher income neighborhoods and neighborhood schools and lower income neighborhood schools. So that's, that's the number one challenge. But why does that matter? Because if you believe that quality schools rely on uh, quality teachers, lower income school schools that cannot really finance higher incomes for, set, for, for teachers basically rely on less experienced teachers. And so we do have this upside down world in which schools that have the you know, greatest sets of challenges have the least resources to do that. They have the teachers with the least experience. They have uh, school leadership with the least experience. And that's why our whole system is really upside down. What we really need to do is if we care about this very simple principle, which is equality of opportunity for every child in America, we would make sure that those schools that have the greatest challenges have the greatest resources. But that is basically the opposite of what we do and why we have these conversations uh, 20, 30, 40 years later. And so uh, essentially, you know, there's a lot of research around these issues, which is that um, lower income neighborhoods pay teachers a lot less. They have, they spend much less per pupil. They have fewer resources from art and music to everything else for their schools. And, and, you know, year after year, that has a cumulative impact. And where we do see well-resourced schools in low-income neighborhoods, we have much better outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I think uh, we get into all these conversations about choice and other issues, but at the heart of the matter, we really need to have a discussion in this country and with conservatives who are attacking public education like I haven't seen in decades. I mean, I do believe public, you know, public schools are under attack because they are the last vestige of ensuring that everybody has a chance. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, all the institutions that are about ensuring equal opportunity in our country are under assault right now. And <laughs> public schools are just one battleground for that assault. Uh, and I hope that <laughs> leaders across the progressive movement recognize that assault and will act accordingly. And uh, as we go forward, recognize that some of these debates we're having about choice are legitimate debates and people should talk about them. But at the end of the day, those are side issues compared to who's getting resources, where are they getting the resources, and like every other issue in our society, every other economic issue or equity issue, it's where you spend the money shows who you value. And when we've gone through decades of disinvestment in public schools, what we're saying is we care less about those issues than the Pentagon budget or whatever else, uh, massive tax cuts for the wealthy um, that uh, are the priority in Washington. So Kev did a report that was striking a few years ago, uh, which found that in 30 states, a teacher heading a family of four would qualify for government assistance. Yeah. And last night I turned on the news. I don't know if any of you saw the West Virginia teacher strike. Yeah. They interviewed, uh, it was like uh, one of your respondents to that study, they interviewed a teacher who said he was working two jobs and on food stamps. Yeah. Uh, and the, and this morning, I think, I think it was, there was an announcement, or maybe it was yesterday, uh, that instead of the 1% raise that West Virginia teachers were being offered that led to the strike, they're now going to get a 5% raise, which uh, may not get everyone off food stamps, but would move move the needle. So Yeah, I would just say, I mean, in 11 states, we did this uh, to just follow up on that. In 11 states, 20% of teachers are uh, needed to work a second job. Yep. And, you know, in 50% of the country, truck drivers are paid more than teachers. You know, we have a lot of discussion about urban schools and suburban schools and coastal discussions about New York City. But in many states in this country, both urban and, they're, you know, they happen to be in the middle of the country in the south, rural and urban teachers are ba basically, you know, the message we send to them is your salary your work is worth so much less than every other thing we do. And I think that's, you can't expect good 
you can't expect excellent outcomes from teachers who are basically paid $25,000, $30,000 a year and say that we really value those kids learning. So on the optimistic tip, there are... <laughs> keep digging. <laughs> yeah, keep digging. No, no, keep I mean, coming let's, let's be this. optimistic. The West Virginia strike, yes. yeah. you know, it's not a, this is not a state with historically successful strikes. Had their Republican governor buckle, a 5% a 5% wage increase is, is, was, is, is positive in a state where they have not been providing that level of raise in years. So when we, you know, basically when we use our power together, we can get better results. Back to Zakia's point. Um, I, I'd note also that on this question of resources, I mentioned California had recently enacted uh, what they call a weighted student formula to add more money for needy kids. Massachusetts did that in the early 1990s, and it propelled that state to become the number one ranking state on achievement. It helped close the achievement gap at mm -hmm. that point. Uh, they did a lot of other things around it, invested in preschool and healthcare and so on. Um, so we do have uh, that kind of act activism across states. New York is still fighting. There are more than 40 states with school finance lawsuits, and as um, John Jackson puts it, you know, every state has its state bird, its state <laughs> calendar, its state uh, school finance lawsuit. <laughs> but, but more and more of them have been successful. And so in this last year, and I think we're going to see in the coming years, and this actually is like the 1960s, there are more and more courts that are saying you must uh, make uh, spending more equitable. Uh, Washington State is being fined $100,000 a day until their legislature gets it together to put that accumulated money into the school finance system that is more equitable. And we're seeing that in other places. New Jersey fought this battle for 30 years. They had nine court decisions. I was a student teacher in Camden, New Jersey, so this had personal meaning for me. There were no books in the book room in Camden, New Jersey. Uh, when they finally did um, ad adopt a, an equitable finance system, uh, under a Republican governor, Christy Todd Whitman, in 1998. Uh, they uh, brought up the spending of the uh, mostly high minority districts, Trenton, Newark, Patterson, et cetera, to the level of the suburban districts. And uh, they propelled themselves to um, uh, both cut the achievement gap and become one of the highest performing states in the country. They ranked number one in writing, uh, in the top five in everything else. 45% students of color in that state, more than a third of kids in poverty. So when we do act, we, we get results. And uh, there is a lot of activity going on. Uh, Roberto, let me ask you, um, you've kind of gone from the White House to the schoolhouse in your focus right, right. now with Teach Plus. So you can uh, approach this from both or either perspective. Uh, but I know that Teach Plus is um, helping educators participate in policy conversations and advance their practices in support of students. So how are you helping position teachers as allies to help advance racial equity and uh, tackle these opportunity gaps? Yeah. Well, well, thank you, Linda. First, let me just uh, say how honored I am to be part of the conversation today. And I want to thank you and LPI for hosting this and convening us because I think you know we've had a tough conversation this morning to date <clears throat> around unpacking some of the data here. But I think this is really the important first step is for us to acknowledge as, an, as a policy community and as an American community the manifestation of growing segregation, of inequality, of racism, of bias in our schools. And we've had a policy conversation here I've been a part of for the last 20 years in Washington that has not fully owned those challenges, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, has not put those challenges front and center in terms of the policymaking process. So I do believe this is the important first step as we also kind of wrestle and, and grapple with and reach for the solutions and, and the hopeful uh, um, way forward. I also, you know, I want to give voice to some of the other opportunity costs uh, that, that have been discussed uh, already this morning. And we've talked a lot about the achievement gap and, and you know, some of the ground that we've lost even over the last 30 years. Uh, you know, I think w when we think about, again, from a student's perspective, particularly our, our diverse students who are linguistic minorities, the messages that policies have sent to them, messages that, you know, uh, devalue rather than uh, reaffirm their identity, their presence in their classroom, uh, policies that limit the 
uh, uh, use of their native language in their instruction that we've had to wrestle with that we're still working to recover from in places like California. Uh, the policies around um, uh, addressing social and emotional needs of our students or the, the lack of attention to that effort, particularly for our students that have grown up in communities in poverty where we know there, that uh, a number of our students are wrestling with the impact and the effects of poverty and of trauma and where we have failed as an education system to mount uh, the efforts that are needed to reaffirm and support their success and in fact have perpetuated policies that subject them to disproportionate rates of discipline, suspension, expulsion, which further feeds the school to prison pipeline. Um, the, the fabric of teaching and learning in our schools under two generations of standards-based reform, right, where we have a set of policies at the federal level that support accountability for all students, that have high standards for all students. But the nature of teaching and learning, and you write so eloquently about this in your paper uh, in the packet, Linda, uh, about the curriculum, the challenges around curriculum and the curriculum gap. Uh, opportunities for active teaching and learning, for project-based learning, for returning agency to our students and moving from a very didactic approach to teaching and learning, which has, I think, dominated a lot of standards-based reform and has been, uh, unfortunately, I think, a um, product of standards-based reform in certain places, moving to return that agency to our students. So I think all of these, some of these are just kind of the opportunity costs that, uh, in addition to what we've talked about already this morning, that are part of our lessons from Kerner. Uh, and I think remind us and call us to uh, a couple of things. Uh, I think they call us to a uh, stronger agenda and stronger policies that directly address these challenges and these disparities. And we've had, we've focused on a systemic level of policy in, in, in American education over the course of the generations of standards-based reform. We need policies that directly impact students and their teachers and directly address these disparities and these inequities. Uh, and, and so I, I think there's an agenda uh, that, that we can give birth to at this particular moment uh, on that front. Uh, we haven't talked much about the importance, uh, and I know, I know it's on folks' mind, particularly coming off of yesterday too, the importance of reinforcing a strong and robust Office of Civil Rights, mm -hmm. right? Because we have a, we have a, um, uh, a whole uh, set of laws that our administration really worked hard to uphold and to, re and to reinforce that can be the foundation from which we build a more equitable uh, environment for learning for our students. Uh, but we need that robust enforcement. Uh, and do you have advice level. about how what right people now. ought to do to try to advocate for that? Yeah, I mean, I think the uh, uh, we have fortunately great voices in the advocacy community that have helped to uphold the spirit of Lao and have helped to uphold the spirit of Title VI and, and done more to, to address that. Uh, I think we need to press the government, we need to press the Department of Education to reinvigorate the Office of Civil Rights. Uh, and if you look at the amount of guidance that, is, that, that, that was, was done over the last eight years to uphold those laws, we need that level of enforcement moving forward and we need voices behind that. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, then, and then I think of uh, where we are at this particular moment, and I think of Gary's uh, reflection of having been at three past commemorations <laughs> of Kerner, of the commission, what makes today different? Well, I think we're really in the need of a movement uh, to address and, and to really take action to change uh, the state of education where we are right now. And for me, that movement is about, it begins with what you shared at the beginning of our conversation today, Linda, of Dr. King's aspiration and call to consciousness and to what's right. And when we, when we can recognize what's right and that we are moving in, in a direction that is not right for all kids, uh, and then when we couple that with uh, the information that our teachers and our learners and our families need to truly be 
woke, to be woken to, uh, to the challenge. And this is where I find and draw my hope because our teacher leaders across our Teach Plus network are woke. <laughs> and, uh, and, they are, and their students, and their students, the students are, are woke. woke. Yeah. And that is the second important tenet yeah. uh, to being able to take action. And the third is voice yeah. and bringing that voice forward. So we have uh, our teacher leaders across the country in 11 states and, and regions. And we work, we grow and support teacher leaders in instructional practice, in school by school and teacher by teacher, changing the conditions around teaching and learning for our students. And we support teachers in policy and advocacy, as you mentioned. But we have teachers, uh, you know, like uh, Shana Washington, who's building uh, communities of restorative justice and, and pushing her district to have restorative justice coordinators in her schools in Maryland. Uh, we have teachers like Ashley McCall in Illinois who are pushing and pressing the state legislature to take action on school finance equity. They just passed a law this past year, and they're doubling down on uh, on uh, implementation of state laws around suspension and expulsion uh, and making sure that schools behind the state level policy change, schools have the dollars and the resources and the professional development to implement multi tier systems of supports and behavioral supports for their students. Yeah. You know, and we have uh, teachers like Jose Rodriguez who are advocating on behalf of bilingual learners and a whole set of uh, policy changes at, at the district level to help support uh, and reaffirm bilingualism and, and, and for his students in Texas. So I think this work is done school by school. It's done district by district. I think there's tremendous power. We find tremendous hope in the voice of our teachers to also lift with their and, and, and uh, alongside their learners and their families uh, the imperative for change at the state level. And that is where we're going to get, particularly in this environment in which we're in now in DC. Yeah. Uh, it's it's the momentum at the state and local level that's going to make the difference. Well, I think your, your your theme of you know being woke is is the theme that takes us back to where Zakia started us. I mean, yeah. teachers, parents, Absolutely. students, school board members, um, and and others in a variety of roles. So I want to open us up to questions from the audience. Um, so you can. Uh, organize yourselves, raise your hand if you want the mic to come to you. Um, while you're doing that, I'm just going to give people an opportunity to say if they want to identify some, you know, one thing that they think is, uh, you know, really making a difference in the context that you're working. You just gave several good examples, but uh, I want to give Ann and, and Nira and Zakia that opportunity too. I mean, if I could just say, I think, uh, you know, a little bit of a struggle. I don't know if it's necessarily a pushback, but just to say that I work with uh, communities that, you know, 20 years old, 30 years old. And I would say there's been a movement for decades in black and brown communities, but no yeah. one's been listening, right? Um, from Ella Baker, fight, I mean, Reverend Barber talked about it last oh, we like, we've been, we've been to, fighting we the right? media. Absolutely. To be woke. <laughs> so no one's paying attention. It's not just the media, though. It's like yeah. when people go into policy spaces, they don't bring us along with them. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you keep circling the same crazy policies without mm -hmm. asking students and parents and community members, is this the one that's going to work this time? How has it been working? Even when they're evaluated, no one ever comes to us and said, no one went to the people in New Orleans and said, year into whatever the destruction that they did within that city, and say, how did we do with this? Is creating all charter network space working for you? Because I've been speaking to those folks, and we've been part of that conversation. It has not. You know, like you disrupt, you take away 7,500 black and brown teachers out of a, a system and you don't think that's going to have devastating consequences and there's no conversation that happens. So I would just say the movement, I think, has been there for many, many years. No one's listening. I think part of the shift to the, what we need to do is make sure that we can be in spaces, when we can be in a White House, when we can be some place that can change the policy locally or whatever, that if we're not bringing, and I think James talked about this yesterday, if we're not bringing the most impacted people in there to begin to set that table, not come in after the table was set, but like let's move the fork over here and the knife over here. Mm -hmm. That's not it. It's about before we even put anything on this table, let's talk about this because we have the historical context of what all the things that we've done already. So we can say to community members who've been doing this for 20 years, who have seen mayorship, who have seen superintendents roll over, who have seen all these different things, 
Let's bring you into the space. That has to be an automatic. It's not like, who else do we need to bring? It has to be automatic. And when, the more we do that, and the more we have been able to do that, working with Journey for Justice, and creating that space, intergenerational space, unapologetic space for black and brown people to be in, um, to create and talk about what do we choose as community members. So people see us. We have to create a whole campaign. And while it is, Journey for Justice is, is a unapologetic a black and brown space, the We Choose campaign is interracial, right? And so we know that in order to do this, many of those folks get into those spaces. But we need the people who have their hearts and minds ready to get black and brown and marginalized communities free to be in that space with us, to be in, in collaboration with us, to be in action with us, to be in movement with us. Because just like we've seen many times in Black Lives Matter, at, at one particular instance, I never remember, forget it was so powerful, how white uh, allies surrounded the black and brown folks who were centered at Black Lives Matter to, to protect them from um, you know, the initial attack that was gonna come by police. Right? And to see that happen, it's in the same vein. It may not be, you know, that's just symbolic of what I'm trying to get at. It's like, you have spaces that you can get in, bring everybody along. There are people that have been doing this work for decades all across, and you can go anywhere and find them. There's probably people in this room. There's no reason to reinvent the wheel. As a matter of fact, we don't have time for that. We have solutions that we've been working on, that we've been pushing locally in the statewide level. Like, we've been doing this work, and if we're not there, then it's, it's just, as a matter of fact, it's, it's disingenuous when then we are invited to a space to be like, oh, what do you think? Well, you know, for the 20, last 20 years, we've been saying fund schools so we can have this. For the last 20 years, we've been saying stop suspending our kids, put restorative justice practices in our classrooms, right, and fund that to happen. And I think also I would just say that we have to stop getting caught up in Democrat and Republican. We need to get right party. Because until we get somebody who's doing right by communities who have been marginalized that we keep talking about over again and we're depressed about, then it doesn't matter to me personally if you're a Democrat or Republican. Show and prove, support these communities, and we know how that, what that looks like. And then let's g gather around and rally around as a community, as that village, to support what's happening and what we need to happen. Wonderful. <laughs> All right, we've got somebody raising their hand now. Who's, who's got the mic? Here we go, right there, Sheila. And then in the back, we've got somebody who also wants to get the mic, Steve, uh, right behind. Go ahead, Sheila. Once again, it's great to be here and to uh, see people on the panel that I know, whether from the Kennedy days with Casey Family Programs or uh, Dr. Darlin Hammond, all through New York State uh, standards development as well as other things. But to my, my young sister, Zakia Ansari, I've watched her grow. I've watched her to develop into the leader that she is today. And uh, I know she still has miles to go before she sleeps. <laughs> but Zakari, even though I know your many accomplishments, I don't think everybody else knows. So can you just tell us what's the one thing that you are most excited about that you and your group have been able to maneuver and manipulate on behalf of parents and students? And what's the one area where you're still struggling? Um, start with the struggle first. Uh, I think the struggle, and I keep saying this, and I'll keep coming back to it, is that um, you know, for, for almost 20 years, you know, I've been going up to a place like Albany. <laughs> Um, you know, before I knew what, or I didn't know what organizer one was when I started this work. I had no idea. I didn't know what unions were. I had no idea about the politics that was entrenched in education. No idea. I was minding my business, raising seven kids at the time. <laughs> you know, I had no idea, right? And so it's part of the initial impact of understanding that something is being done to children that's not okay with me, and what can I do? And it's been this journey of understanding what it is that I can do. Um, but along that way, lately, there's just been this, I would say last year was a kind of the gut punch for me, which is I've been going up to Albany for almost 20 years. We had money, there was no, there, we, there was, but there was not time to fund these schools yet. The market crashed, guess what? Still not time to fund these schools. People have rebounded and have more money than they had before. And guess what they're telling us right now? There's still not time to fund those schools. And now, Betsy DeVos is in office. We got a deficit. There's still not time to fund these schools. 
So what am I supposed to take from that? I take that black and brown children and poor children are our priority, period. The problem is, and the struggle has been, to get the masses, the media, to really cover that. And as I shared yesterday, it's almost like they're allergic to the word racism. Even in this vein that we're sitting in right now, and, and granted, you know, you might see it a little more here, a little more there, but culturally insensitive, maybe that person that said that about the KKK was just a little culturally insensitive, no. <laughs> no, right? To sit there and have to, act, to actually talk to a, a reporter and, say, and explain why it's racist, I, I wanna tell you, that is emotionally and psychological abuse. It really is, and that has been. So that's been the struggle, to be able to paint the picture and, and portrait of the children that have been impacted. A decade, a generation of children. For 12 years, we haven't funded schools in New York. $4.2 billion, these, this particular equity lawsuit, only supposed to be a four-year commitment. Black and brown children are at the center of that. So that's why, as AQE, we were able to frame, um, get legislators to proclaim February Racial Justice and Educational Justice Month, right? So that was, those are the things that we have to do to like get the media excited and, and maybe paying attention to this. So that's the, the for me, that's the, the struggle that has been to highlight the children that have been mostly impacted by this. The positive has been, um, is that um, even in those 12 years, one, we have built ourselves up as an organization that is the go-to organization that if you want to know what's happening in regards to equity and education, you come to us. That we have brought parents and continue to bring hundreds of parents every year up to Albany to share their story. That legislators are then, many of them, beginning to understand and to articulate the children that are being impacted. Is it enough? Not at all. And so what I say also is we begin to be able to highlight that when you have, again, I go back to Democrat Republic, our governor's a Democrat, right? But he says money doesn't matter, wants to shut down the last monopoly, um, as well as a whole host of other things. Rahm Emanuel is a Democrat. What's he doing in Chicago, shutting, shuttering schools, even though parents in Chicago have to do on a five-week hunger strike? He was willing to allow them to die. We had to walk 150 miles to Albany. What are these? are not gimmicks, and our governor said, publicity stunt. I got better things to do than walk 150 miles for a publicity stunt. I just want to be clear. I think all that goes back to is just to say that for, for decades, black and brown people have had to put their bodies on the line for what was right, or, and or file a lawsuit. So a promise of brown v. board has not been met. CFE promise after 12 years has not been net, met. The current report and all this other stuff, we're still having these conversations. I go back, and I will continue to go back. What has been different? What have we not done? Because we've done so many other things. We have not centered racism and classism in any conversation. So if we talk about policy and all the things that we can change, we will get some movement. But will we get the movement to make change? I don't think so. And we have to be uncomfortable in these spaces to have these conversations. We have to be honest in these spaces to have conversations. I can't afford to. We don't want to see more children. We don't, I, I don't want to see more children have to suffer. Education is a right. There's no reason that there are children that don't have access. At Baltimore, they're freezing in schools. And we're not outraged and on the streets. There's no reason, right? And I'm willing to accept that there are people out there that don't give a damn about my kids. I, I get it. And if we are more than willing to accept that, then we can counter that. To say, then those people are those folks, but what are we going to do? What part are we going to play in making sure that children are OK? The outrage is essential. We have about seven minutes. We've got a question right there. And then uh, if somebody else has one, please raise your hand. Uh, Barnett Berry with uh, CTQ. Um, these two powerful statements of late. Um, uh, parents and teachers, 66% uh, of America's uh, public and even more parents have trust and confidence in teachers in this country. Uh, one in four teachers are in some external network. Seven in 10 are using technology to connect with each other in ways they never could before. What might be a national strategy uh, to bring parents and teachers in a powerful viral campaign uh, to advance uh, our cause here? Uh, I'll start with Roberto. Yeah, so I have a couple of ideas on that, and I thank you, Barnett, for the, for the question, and I admire the CTQ work you do and the, the network. A number of our teachers also connect to that network, do wonderful work. I do think there's a, a, a lot of power in uh, in, in teachers' voice and teachers' shared experiences across a city, 
across communities, across neighborhoods, because we are still unfortunately uh, in a system that suppresses that voice, where the profession is not where it needs to be, and I admire Nira's uh, amazing work at CAP to begin to build that profession up because I think that's another key to us moving forward on the lessons from Kerner. But that profession right now is lends itself to isolationism when it comes to our teachers. They close the door, there's not opportunities to connect and to share the imperative for change, to share the manifestation of inequity, of racism, of bias in schools. But when teachers begin to connect with one another and, and these are teachers that are in the, in the service of education because they care about learners, because they care about families, they care about communities. I think there's tremendous power in teachers sharing that story so that we can share the imperative for the movement, right? Because I think, Zaki, as you eloquently put, put forth, the movement's been going on. The question is, it's not a shared movement, right? Mm -hmm. There's certain, certain folks that are very comfortable and and pleased with how things look right now for that for their kids versus other kids. So we need we need to bring that, I think we really do need to bring that forth. And I think teachers shared voices, more networking across cities, across states. When our teachers, I was just with uh, nine of our teachers last night, uh, electronically connected, sharing stories about what the school finance uh, advocacy play looked like in Illinois. Across, across the country to Texas, where we have a, set, a working group that's beginning to look at issues around school finance equity in Texas. And sharing strategies, the importance of those teachers and the voices of those teachers, not just being teachers whose communities and children were impacted, but also teachers from other communities who, who are not directly impacted by this manifestation, but who understand it's not right who share the imperative and the conscious for change. So I think that's how you, that's how you build it. So can I just add something to this, which is to say um, we've seen the power of that connection between teachers and parents in, I'd say, in opposition. So if you kind of look at what's happened over the last 10 years about the standard-based movement, I think what's a lot of what happened is that parents trusted teachers who felt like this you know, the overemphasis on testing was uh, neg it was having a negative impact. I mean, I'll say this about my kids. Mm -hmm. I have, my kids are in public schools in Washington, D.C., and when a teacher was, when, a, you know, great teachers tell you that I have to teach to the test, that means a lot to the parents. And so I think one of the reasons why this, this push on standards has been, uh, on testing, has been pushed back is because there was a kind of informal alliance between parents and teachers saying, enough already. And parents really relied on teachers. And, and I think that's an important thing. So how do we make that stronger in the affirmative? And I think the truth is that we need parents and teachers community-wide, suburban, urban, uh, joining arms around some of these issues because the truth is policymakers, political leaders, uh, are, are, it's easy for them to pit suburban schools against urban schools or rural schools against suburban schools. And what we really need is for people to recognize that we have a shared commonality and increasing investment across arenas. No one's, no one's invested enough, I mean some schools, but that Truly, suburban schools have a vested interest, or wealthier schools have a vested interest in the outcomes for lower-income schools. And I think everything Zakia has said points to that this split has been too fundamental in education. We all have to own up to that. Right. Can I just share that we are part of the Alliance to Reclaim Our Schools table? Um, I think it might be almost four years old now, and it was intentional to do just that, right? Mm -hmm. To bring the two largest teachers unions a part of it, as well as locals. Um, as well as community organizations, youth organizations, national youth organizations like the Alliance for Educational Justice, our local organization, AQE, but also Journey for Justice is part of that. And then we were created that table intentionally to be able to do that. And so, you know, that's part of the conversation because we know and understand the importance of that, uh, that collaboration and work that we do together. And I'll just chime in, and I think we need to look for collaborative opportunities everywhere with every uh, poss all possible uh, partners. Uh, uh, 
watching what's happening in Florida, we've got to remember how powerful our student voices mm -hmm. yeah. can be. Uh, in Virginia, we found our business community to be um, uh, very effective partners on advocating for um, uh, uh, critical thinking, collaborative learning, communications have really helped us uh, uh, push on resource issues for K-12 education, as well as for opening up a little bit more space for um, creativity in our schools. Uh, Project-based learning, we've got a great, one of one of the schools I'm most excited about in, in my hometown, Richmond City, right now is we've just started a, a second year of a Code RVA regional magnet school with diversity as an express um, um, uh, value uh, and part of built into the system. But 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 it was a, something that was supported by the com business community, helping create um, uh, the next generation of, of um, high-tech workforce. Uh, so, uh, you know, looking for partners everywhere. I don't know that we can get the business community to be our partners on one of the fundamental things that comes back to politics, which is I do think the increasing income inequality, and this, I have no reason, I have no, I can't find any way to be optimistic about this other than to say that this increasing income inequality and its impact at all, at all government levels and at all, uh, in, in schools and housing everywhere, uh, um, and your charts on the wealth gaps as well as the income gaps, it's just so depressing that I, I, I think that's, uh, that's uh, um, something that is going to come down to politics that's going to have to fix it. And I, that's, that's, there's where I'll find my Pollyanna, that our new American community our, and our woked up communities of all sorts are going to have to address that on a wider societal basis. Just real quick, I yes. just think, you know, as we, I think it's important for us as we, the collective us, like there's words that trigger communities. And so like to be conscious of, you know, some of the language and things that we use as we move forward with policy. And so for me, like, you know, the word like integration and diversity, it takes on different forms. And I think sometimes we have to have a definition of what that looks like when we enter communities, as well as maybe engage those communities and what you mean by, you know, diversity integration, because often sometimes those things have been detrimental to us or, or at, at the expense of us in regards to like gentrification and things like that. And so I think just to be conscious of, and it's not just those, it's anything when you come into a community to like bring your full self and open self to be responsive and to pay attention to how people respond to that because it could just like just implode something that you really have good intentions about if we're not really engaging the community and, and are we using the right language? As simple as that. So we are out of time. I want to pick on this last theme of collaboration. Um, that people brought out as we were thinking about the next steps. Uh, there's an old African proverb that if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. We have a long way to go. We need to go there together. Uh, and help me thank this panel for their contribution. And I am going to uh, invite the panel to get comfortable in the audience. I'm going to invite up our last speaker who's going to close out uh, this conversation. Oops, I'm going to pick up my microphone while I do that. And I'll introduce uh, Kent. So I'm just delighted our last comments will be made by uh, one of my favorite um, speakers who is always inspiring. Um, Kent McGuire is one of the folks who've been in this business uh, doing this work, this very work, for a long time. He is now the Program Director of Education at the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. He's the prior President and CEO of the Southern Education Foundation. Uh, and uh, before that was uh, Dean at the College of Education at Temple University, my alma mater. Uh, doing work in Central City education, uh, and uh, before that, or maybe after that, I can't remember the order, he was Assistant Secretary for Research in the Department of Education. Um, Kent has been thinking about these issues of equity, the issues of uh, integration, segregation, uh, school funding, uh, deeper learning, uh, and how you bring all of that together on behalf of children uh, in all communities, in all classrooms for a very long time. I'm delighted that he is going to send us off uh, today with words of wisdom. Kent, thank you.
Um, <clears throat> I am absolutely certain that I am not going to take any more of these you get the last word opportunities. <laughs> um, I really don't understand why I get asked to do this. Um, <laughs> and each time I try, it gets harder and harder uh, to do, especially when I think um, pretty much everything that needs saying has actually been said. So what do you do? Um, I'm going to probably make a point about facts somewhere in here, uh, probably a point or two about transformation, uh, and maybe a point about power. Those are probably the three things I'll, I took from the two, the two panels. But let me just, let me start this way. Um, Linda started by trying to date a number of people in the room. <laughs> um, she spared me. But I'm going to date myself, just to give you some sense of um, the meaning uh, that being here holds. I was, during those riots in Detroit, on a trip to California in a brand new Oldsmobile station wagon. Um, I think my dad would have turned um, we stayed, let me say this, this was way back when there were this best Western motel chain. There's probably only five people in this room who remember a best Western, but it was the, in, in the 60s, it was the equivalent of a Holiday Inn Express. You know, it was brand new, shiny, and they built them all the way across Interstate 80, and here we were stopping each night at a Best Western, looking forward to jumping into the swimming pool. While my dad would walk into the house, into the hotel room, to turn the TV on to see what was happening in Detroit. Now he might, had it not been for my mother, have turned around and gone back to Michigan. Uh, for he was very active. He was the um, president of Local 652 of the United Auto Workers in Lansing, Michigan, very active in the civil rights struggles of that state. Um, his brother, Robert Little, in fact, there were no text messages in those days, right? So you had to actually pick a phone up and call somebody. <laughs> And Robert Little, Malcolm X's brother, would call Cyril McGuire and give him updates about what was actually going on. Um, so I remember these times in a rather personal way. Um, and all I can say um, about the history lesson that Linda gave us uh, with real confidence, is that the infrastructure that came to exist as a consequence of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act and the larger war on poverty um, was that um, all of that infrastructure accrued to my benefit, unquestionably. In fact, in the wake of those Detroit riots, uh, an organization called New Detroit was created to help build the city, right? New Detroit found me, sent me to Columbia University uh, to participate in this brand new program in the politics of education. I was an economics major, so I spent half my time in the economics department and the other half over at Teachers College. Um, it allowed me to do um, uh, many things. Um, my wife would argue too many things. Um, and for all those reasons, I just appreciate the opportunity just to stand here and actually reflect. Now, um, two really wonderful panels. 
Linda, is what I would say, both to sort of put the record straight, tell us where we've been, remind us of where we are, uh, and also a panel to help us consider, you know, the implications for, uh, for action. Nira, I think your burden is huge uh, in terms of pushing um, on kind of national uh, policy and trying to impact fiscal federalism in this country in ways that it needs to be uh, uh, touched. Um, I would just observe, and this is the, my point about the facts, uh, is that um, the facts speak for themselves. Um, Linda's facts, Gary's facts, Patricia's facts, they're all working from publicly available longitudinal data. So, you know, there's no quarrel we should have with the facts. Um, they're irrefutable, the stratification uh, with regard to both access and opportunity that the facts reveal. Um, we probably do need to think through new and more imaginative ways to sort of bring these facts into wider view. That'd be one conclusion I would reach, and many of us need to figure out uh, what that would look like, what it would entail. Um, as I'm learning uh, to ask now, what it would cost, <laughs> but uh, but that's 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 one thing. And then there's another reality about the facts, uh, which is that this is not about the facts. Um, I certainly learned this up close in the last eight years I spent in the Deep South, um, where um, I ran an organization that got really good at putting the facts in front of people. Folks were not confused about the facts. <laughs> they really weren't. They were not confused about the facts. We told them. Kids are poor. They're in deep poverty. Um, kids aren't learning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They weren't confused about any of that. They just weren't interested in the facts, yeah. right? And so that's the other reality with which we must contend. Uh, we have to actually bring the facts we have into wider view, and we have to also grapple with the facts that it's not always about the facts. And I think we've got to figure out how to work both those things. Um, uh, next thing I would say is that um, I was taken with Patricia's observations about the wonderful new qualities of this diverse majority we now have, you know, just how resilient, how collaborative, uh, how multilingual and multicultural are today's students, right? Uh, which leads me to observe that uh, a point about transformation, you know, we've really dropped the ball, uh, us adults, uh, not just with regard to public policy, but also with regard to our conception of schools in this country. Um, we're st still tinkering by and large around the edges of a system that was created 70 years ago for the express purpose of sorting kids. That's what it was built to do. Now, 70 years ago, um, you were growing up in Lansing, Michigan, you could walk over to Oldsmobile and you could get a job in the plant and you could make a very decent middle class living, right? There is no Oldsmobile today, right? Um, and we actually have to figure out how to create a system or transform the system we have evolve more rapidly toward a system that's actually designed to help young people learn to learn, right? And all those qualities uh, that Patricia laid out 
uh, are just sitting there in, in front of us. I say this to you corporately now as the person who has inherited something called deeper learning. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, and I can't run from it, um, uh, but I better be careful how fast I run toward it. Um, if I can't figure out or help us figure out how to do it in a way that actually accrues uh, to the kids who need it the most. And I'm actually deeply worried about the extent to which we have actually figured that out. That brings me finally to my third point about power. Because I promised I would do this in 15 minutes. You are who I promised I would, <laughs> I would do this. Otherwise, I would say I require much more time. But, um, um, and, and, and it's this. Um, while we struggle with the facts, and while we get clearer about the transformation that we also need, um, we might as well come to terms with the fact uh, that the conversation we're having here and the fact that we're trying to do this on the occasion of the 50th year anniversary of the Turner Commission is that this is inevitably about power. It is in inevitably about power. And so when we bring the facts forward and marshal a conversation about school transformation, we really do have the unfortunate burden, I personally think, of putting this in a broader political and social context greatly diminished public support for many things, not just the schools. Gradual privatization of pretty much everything, right? The prisons, healthcare system, schools, uh, arguably correlated with the decline in the proportion of white middle class students. We're running out <laughs> of them. There's not enough of them left. Um, that's number one. Number two, changing public expectation. Uh, I've looked at polling data in the South. Um, and Raymond, you're going to need to look at these data. Um, that shows it's not that folks don't care about the collective good. It's just that it's dropped down the list of priorities in the times in which we currently live. Imagine a baby boomer um, taking care of his or her parents on the one hand and still paying for their kids' college on the other. They're sort of in this sort of trap, you know, between these two tectonic plates. Um, they're increasingly focused on and are inclined to prioritize the returns to individuals over public outcomes and public ends. Um, couple that with the ascendancy of market theories as holding solutions to our most pressing problems. We've just been through two decades of a rather focused, highly disciplined, well-resourced narrative about all the things bad with government. Now, reflect back to how Linda started this conference. In the days of the commission, what had we been through? We had fought two world wars. Uh, we fought a Korean War. We fought a Cold War. And we came out with a dividend. That dividend, we decided in the moment to turn to our most pressing domestic challenges. The country thought that government, to be brief, was part of the solution, not part of the problem. 
that nair nira has been flipped on its completely uh, on its ear right and my time is nearly up <laughs> actually my time is up but this is not new for me <laughs> i have no experience i'm used to bells ringing in my ear and perfectly capable of ignoring them if i have a little more say but I would just argue that we have to put the facts and our ideas about school transformation in the broader context of the kind of social dynamics uh, that, uh, that are operating uh, at least right now. And I think this brings me back to Zakia uh, and her arguments about building power. Um, and Gary's uh, observation that we are um, a catastrophe in the making. Point is this, uh, we need to figure out how uh, to help folks with power understand more vividly the implications of not addressing these issues for the quality of the lives they lead. Um, if we can't connect those dots, this will just take that much longer. And the longer it takes, uh, the harder this uh, is to solve. Um, and the, the more kids, to Zakia's point, we lose. Um, I, all, I knew when I got up here, nothing I would say would be particularly helpful. Um, but I just want you to know it felt good to say it. <laughs> and with that, I close the On that note, you don't now know why I asked Kent to uh, perform this benediction, uh, because there's always so much to take home. Uh, I'll just leave us with this thought. Uh, it is not only about helping those in power see how this redounds to their benefit. I think about a school bond issue that was being brought in a community in Southern California that had once been an all-white community, now mostly Latino. Uh, many older voters, et cetera, uh, and they had an ad on the television which showed the little kids playing and then made the point that these are the children who are going to support with their taxes your Social Security, uh, your health care, uh, the quality of your life. How much education do you want them to have? Uh, and so we got to bring that point, but we also have to be about the business of acquiring more power uh, for those who already hold these views. Don't forget to vote. And on that note, thank you for coming. All the materials will be available on the website.